Previously on Praxis Gas. So there's exactly one person to blame tonight. There yeah. is, yes. Yes. And it's David. No, it's not. It's really not. <laughs> Whatever it is. Well, it is your fault if um, giving Rob free reign results in us all losing our minds. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I've said before on the podcast that I've only ever considered getting one tattoo, and it's to say, Misery Loves Company. I think that's just podcasting in general, isn't it? Yeah, it's part of the parasocial relationship. That and watching (laughs) Justified. Yeah, it's the only thing thing we've got to look forward to is episodes of Justified. Everything else is extremely depressing. Yes, a TV show finished how many years ago? Exactly. (laughs) They're bringing it back. It's not the point. What? What? (laughs) They're doing doing a spin-off set in Detroit, apparently. I have already oh. established this is not the episode where we talk about Justified. <laughs> we well, yeah. haven't established yet, what the episode should we Should we put is. it to a vote? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's whoever draws first. Hello and welcome back to Podcasting as Praxis for the 200th fucking episode where we finally talk about Justified. I'm David, my pronouns are he and him. I'm James, my pronouns are they and them. I'm Jamie, my pronouns are he and him. I'm Rob, my he and him. And I'm Alistair, my pronouns are also he and him. Yeah, and tonight we're talking about criminal minds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've just finished season two of, of, of Elementary. I'm, I don't know what you were watching, Jamie. <laughs> I, was, I was watching season two of Red Dwarf. Uh, I don't know if that <laughs> Well, I was watching season six of Justified after saying two years ago that I would fucking watch this show and get it done so <laughs> i've finally done it we're here i've managed that more for you that we continue doing this podcast specifically so that we can make you watch the rest of that uh rest of this tv show <laughs> yeah you I'm should get started on watching elementary so we could do episode 300 on that <laughs> <laughs> i'm enjoying the fact that in the time it's taken you to finish watching it david i've lapped you like four times <laughs> so, uh, yes I know, I know, but I got there, so um, yeah, it, it's done, and it was very good. I enjoyed it a lot. Right, show over, great. But what is a Justified? Okay, well, fair enough then. Uh, Justified is a television show, or I should say was a television show, but more on that later, um, that was based on a short story, uh, and the premise of it is essentially a US Marshal by the name of Raylan Giddens, who grew up in Kentucky and got the fuck out of Kentucky, but never really got Kentucky out of him. And as the series begins, he is forced to move back to Kentucky and confront his past and who he is. And the series is that it's about Raylan Givens in Kentucky grappling with who he is. And thesis number one, Justified, is a brilliant example of why the Writers Guild of America strike that's taking place right now is entirely justified. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because Justified, the short story it's based on, it features Raylan Givens and a villain by the name of Boyd Crowder. Um, Boyd Crowder is not a US Marshal. He is a former veteran um, who comes back from Iraq and falls in with the criminal life of his family and ends up being a neo Nazi uh, for a whole arguably bunch of shit not- in the show. Yeah arguably arguably he's not really he's just doing it because it's a way to get people riled up to do like you know work for him um and he you know he he blows up something in town and then robs a bank and keeps doing it over and over um in the short story he dies at the end of the short story and that was the original plan for justified they wrote the first season and it had boyd crowder was just a one and done villain on the pilot episode but Here's the problem. Boy Crowder is played by Walton Goggins, and if anyone has a ridiculous name to match the ridiculous name of Timothy Oliphant, it's Walton Goggins. And he, he <laughs> brought his A-game. He brought his A-game so hard that when they tested the pilot, everyone said, oh, that's fantastic. I can't see wait to see what happens next between those two. And the writers and the directors and everyone involved had enough sense to go, hang on, we've discovered lightning in a bottle here. And they rewrote the entire show around walton goggins being a main cast member and it being about essentially this weird kind of camaraderie antagonism between Raylan and boyd crowder and for this reason the first season of justified feels a little bit inconsistent but it's because they were literally rewriting it as they went um, i think it was it was more that they that when they wrote the pilot 
the original ending was Boyd dies, and then yes, yes, in the testing. They just they did they rewrote the end of the fir- of the pilot and then yeah. the rest of the series was made after that rewrite as far as I well, understand it. Well, no, they did actually have most of the series the first series like mapped out, but the the original vision I went and did some research for this. The original vision was it was going to be kind of not quite monster of the week, but Marshall story of the week essentially riffing off the short story kind of thing, and realizing that they were going to have a through thread with Boy Crowder meant that suddenly they're like, oh, we need to drastically rewrite this. Because remember, uh, Boyd's family and all the rest are there, but Boyd's relationship takes a very central kind of role with them. And this is this is why you need writers after you start, you know, filming the show. You can't just like say, "Oh, they've written the script; it's done." It's like no, it's it comes alive in the performance and in what it reveals itself between the actors. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, solidarity with the WGA may they be successful. And I really yep. hope the strike doesn't fuck up the the sequel series they're doing, which we'll talk about at the end. I think it won't. I'm pretty sure it's finished filming already. Oh, is it? That'd be so good. It's due for release sometime this summer. Yeah, because like we support the right of labour to strike, but we are also little treat hogs, and you know we would like to have both. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it happily the people who make our treats are the people who are striking to make us better treats. So you know it all works. Yes. It's a virtuous cycle. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Your fun fact: um, Walton Goggins turned that fucking rule down. Did he really? Did he? That's incredible. Yeah. He did. He turned he it thought, down because yeah. he thought that it was going to be like really fucking just bad Stereotype vibes about redneck, rednecks. Right? Yeah. yeah. And it was it was only after I think it was Timothy Oliphant fucking like strong armed him into it and yeah, tried it out. And he, he enjoyed it that much. Yeah. So thank fuck for that because it, I well, don't think anybody else could have done that role quite anywhere near as well. No. no, he had a he had a major effect on it too. Actually, Walton Goggins because. Um, thesis number two, Justified, is also about class politics, though it's oh, not yeah, very that, obvious. It's like oh, it's 100% yeah. the entire about class basis politics. of like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why that's, pretty that's much everyone not, does anything. That's not really a surprise to anyone, I don't think. Like, it's, no, no, but, you know, it's sorry. Where, there, are pe- there are people who watch it and miss it, but... Uh, they go, what cool God- cowboy. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and to be fair, it has a very fucking cool cowboy, but that's not the point. <laughs> yeah, it's and so, so cool. It's like, honestly, it's just a really fucking cool show and if you haven't watched it you should genuinely do yourself a favor and you know watch it because it's also I mean, otherwise why are you listening <laughs> i mean this it is literally this episode is just going to be a love letter to the series so um, it, it really if you haven't clued, been clued in on that already um here it is <laughs> yeah, yeah 150 just... episodes of fucking references didn't do the job for you yeah exactly <laughs> But it's also, like, it's, it's one of these shows that works on multiple levels, because if you just want to engage with it superficially, cool cowboy. If you want to actually sit and get into the political side of it, like, it's, oh, it's got some really good class politics. And if you want to get really deep into it, there's a lot going on beneath the surface with characters and motivations. They're actual characters, like, they, they are deep, complex people that change over time. Um, and there's a lot there's a lot to grasp. I, I genuinely think season two of Justified is one of the finest it's seasons of television yeah, it's that's absolutely, ever been filmed. Yeah. You know, um, I would call it. I would genuinely put it up there with Shakespeare. And no, I'm not talking up. It genuinely is that good. And also, and... it's just so fun to hate Dicky Bennett. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is this is the thing. It's um, genuinely they just kept getting banger after banger after banger when they uh when they when they picked out actors for this. It's just it's so good. Like the casting was so strong throughout. Um, I'm really and quite yet, blown away by and it. And yet they have Michael Crapperport in fucking season five, don't they? Well, every you know everything that is not made by God must have at least one floor, right? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I mean, you know how the cultural committee episodes work. We normally fucking go through and we talk about the plot, and then we just you know basically relive the fucking film or whatever we've watched for six fucking <laughs> yeah. seasons of this. We just we That's just relive our horrors, yeah. Yeah, so um, rather than do that, we, we're going to try and go through it in a slightly chronological way. So Jamie's going to kick us off with like the first episode and talk us through that, and then we're just kind of going to go on a season by season basis after that. Yeah, I yeah. mean the the start of the show is um, like Timothy Oliphant and his cowboy hat going into like a it's like a rooftop restaurant in Miami. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sitting down with Zed from Pulp Fiction. And uh, he was like sitting having his dinner. Yes. Said yeah. Pulp Fiction. And telling him he's got like fucking two minutes to get out of town or he's going to shoot him. 
<laughs> well, sp- specifically, he gave him a deadline saying you've got 24 hours to leave town or I'm going to shoot you. Yeah, and he, and then he sits down like... and tells him he's got two minutes. Well, yeah, and honestly, great. like I'm, I'm, I'm up, with, I'm there with Zed. I'm like, I'm sorry, can I finish my crab cakes first? Like, I, I, I too would, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's, se- it's, um, it's, it's explained later on that the guy like, uh, blew up a, like just some random bystander in, uh, South America. I forget which country they say they were in. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, somewhere in Central America. It's like, uh, yeah, Panama or somewhere in 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 those areas. Yeah, they're both the they're, they're both down there chasing like a guy who's uh, turned rat on the the Miami mob, mm-hmm. and like the the like Zed from Pulp Fiction blows the guy up with a hand grenade just to like make a point to Raylan, and then so when they're both back in Miami, Raylan like tells him he's got to get out of town or he's going to get shot. It's actually worse than a hand grenade. What he does is he's got them both tied up. And he's questioning. It's not that's not the guy who he blows up. My understanding is they're looking for a third guy, and Raylan might know where he is. So he pull, he, he captures Raylan, and he also captures this bystander who happened to be with Raylan, helping him. And just yeah. to make a point to Raylan about how serious he is, he puts a stick of dynamite in the other guy's mouth and blows him up in front of Raylan. And so Raylan, understandably, when he gets back to Miami and sees him there, uh, is is not happy about it. So thus the opening to our show. Yeah, and then in in the end, the guy pulls. The guy pulls his gun first and so gets shot like all over his crab cakes. But uh it's it ruffles a few then, feathers, like, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah like his very, boss yes. is chewing him out. His boss is I, chewing I him almost, out. For that. I almost stopped watching at that point. I'm like, but what about the crab cakes? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, his boss chews him out for that. Um because like, you know, you're not you're not allowed to just shoot people on site anymore. But it was technically like okay because the guy pulled his gun first, even though he backed him into a corner and made him do it. So to like hide him away from like you know the publicity until it like that or like you know for, while it dies down, he sends him to the my air to the Kentucky office mm-hmm. in Lexington, um, because the guy that runs that used to train firearms with him at Glencoe, is it the Glencoe? Yeah, Glencoe, yeah, yeah. yeah. at 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 uh, Marshall School basically. Yeah, and so he sends him back there. Um, it, despite his protests that he doesn't want to go back to Kentucky. Um, and so he gets there and like just hurtles into like, you know, his past. Um, mm. cause his, his dad who he hates is there. Uh, his ex-wife is there with a Although new husband. His dad, his dad doesn't make an episode, uh, an appearance of like, so like three or four or something. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, anyway, like I think we've been recording for like twenty minutes, and we've just talked about like the first four minutes of this <laughs> of this yeah, show. This so you real. know, just <laughs> just Stop strap in for in. this one. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the 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 main case that like he, he gets assigned to back in Kentucky is uh, a guy who like blows up cars as a distraction and then robs a bank um, with his like white supremacist like I hesitate to call them army. Commandos, I think is the word Commando, he uses. Commandos, yeah, they crowd yeah. commandos, yeah. Um, and it turns out like the Raylan knows the guy and used to work like down a mine with him when he was a teenager. Um, so he goes and like meets the guy, um, and the guy's brother has just been killed by his wife. And it turns out like you know she remembers Raylan from school, and so Boyd, like. Because Boyd wants to like, uh, wants to look after in like big scary air quotes, his like brother's widow. He um he sends like a fucking hilarious dipshit to go and like kidnap her. <laughs> um, and then like Raylan gets involved, and so Boyd gives Raylan twenty four hours to get out of town, and then they end up like having a showdown at uh, at Ava, that's the woman at her house. In the same at the same dinner table where she shot her husband, with the blood stain still in the floor, we might add. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, getting shot. Get it, once again. You know, another crime against dinner. This this whole show. I've actually on rewatching it. <laughs> this whole show is just you know. This shows. I like it, even though I should. So you know that should tell you why you should watch this. Yeah, and so because Boyd, like like a lot of fucking characters throughout the the show, Boyd is obsessed with the idea that Raylan like quick drew on a guy at the dinner table and they essentially recreate that and boy gets shot in the chest for his trouble Mm. 
Um, yeah, Ava, but... Ava turns Ava turns up when Boyd and uh, Raylan are sat at the dinner table with the shotgun that Raylan has left at the front door. And as she stood at the uh, the doorway, pointing the gun at Boyd, Boyd goes to pick up his gun, and uh, Raylan shoots him dead in the like right in the middle of the chest. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a conversation about how you know don't don't you train people to aim for the heart? Um, because like you know the the main the 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 main like central thesis of Justified is that you can't choose your mates. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know what I mean. He's he's not prepared to kill Boyd because they 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 did like a, the the most working class job together once. So yeah, they yeah. dug coal together, which is you yeah. know it's, it's 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 the previous century's version of we used to podcast together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then so then like the the rest of season one uh, is um, mostly like crime of the week stuff. Mm. But I, I, uh, I still quite enjoy all the like. Oh no, it's it's, yeah, it's good. good. It's good. Stuff, it's yeah. it's not it's, as good um, as later seasons, but it's still solid. Especially when you understand what they were doing behind the scenes, and especially when we, I think we have to give a shout out specifically to Hatless. Yeah, that's a fucking yeah, incredible episode. That, that's mm. such a good yeah. episode. In, introduces. Uh, I mean, I was going to say my favorite character, but like there are many favorite characters in this. Uh, Jerry mm. Burns as uh, Win Duffy is yeah fucking is incredible. Such oh, a highlight. So yeah, it's like it's the fucking um, version one Win Duffy as well, where he's like just <laughs> pure fucking like Raj the whole yeah, time. Yeah, I'm gonna skin you, and uh, all you're gonna do unless you get me my money. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. He's... This show has a great thing where they they cast someone, they're not meant to come back. They're so good that they come back, and they come back after getting shot, being more interesting. It's like you know, two <laughs> for two in the first season. No, Hat- Hatless is incredible. Uh, as as you might guess from the title, he loses his hat at the start. And, In the dumbest um... fucking way possible. To... <laughs> <laughs> it is great that the premise of a hatless episode is that his you know he's he's on leave because he shot a lot of people recently, and yeah. uh, he goes to meet his ex wife at a bar, and while he t- he turns up early, and there's two guys just talking really obnoxious shit next to him. And he's already pretty fucking drunk at this point. So they square up against each other and they decide to step outside. And uh, he has a good go of it, but they beat the shit out of him and take his hat. And it's a fight he picked. He didn't have to have that fight. And he spends the rest of the episode just kind of at a bit of a loss whilst also trying to solve a problem for his ex-wife's husband um, involving, we'd find out later, the Detroit mob. So yeah, it's, he's uh, like... Um, so Raylan, Raylan is basically an arsehole, but an affable one uh, for the most part but um Winona Raylan's ex her new husband is just a piece of shit just oh yeah he's such a dweeb as well it's incredible yeah like, he's yeah. like a, like, <laughs> like just a wet fucking dweeb <laughs> but just a piece of shit at the same time what I really love about Justified is every single character especially the likable ones are all tragically flawed people in various different ways like they've all got something glaringly wrong with them the more you learn about them i think the first fair to say the first season is like a bit of a slow burn but then you get into like the last couple of episodes then you get to meet like the boy crowd of walter and gorgas and like his father and like the extended sort of like crowd of crime family and the concept of them mm. you know the, the, these people of all they're all like it's like six families and they all have essentially like vendetta level of like grudges against each other uh including like the givens so railing givens his family has been like a problem with the crowd for a really long time and everybody because it's all like the same five families who lived in the same valley or holler for like 500 years so they all yeah, just fucking like hate each other yeah i think i think the thing that sort of stands out for me about Boyd in the first season is that it just goes to show he's just a straight up opportunist like he yeah. will do whatever is convenient for him to get whatever it is that he wants whether it's join like literally becoming uh, like a, a white supremacist like Nazi or um like is it is it his I can't remember is it is it his dad that shoots uh, Johnny in the stomach or is it Boyd it's, it's, it's his, his dad. dad's. It's his, yeah, dad's, it's his dad. Like season one, boy crowd is very interesting because, um, to his credit, and they go they go places with this. Like after getting shot, he has a religious conversion, 
Yeah, and, or does he? <laughs> well, this is the thing. Like the the text actually shows you that he did, but it was you know it, it didn't go well for him. And like his religious conversion is is very prideful, and he decides that he's gonna make up for his past sins by using his criminal past to essentially take out the drug trade in you know in in Harlan. And unfortunately, him doing this gets all the men who agree to follow him killed by his dad. And, um, you know, so there's this whole thing that Boyd is struggling to not be his father's son in the aftermath of getting shot. And he has like, he basically gets shot, has a crisis of identity, ends up having a, a, a kind of crisis of faith as the first season goes on. And there's a real question of like, is Boyd redeemable? Can he actually change? Which they gradually tease apart and, well... Well, you know, I think we should, I don't know, should we, should we get on to, like, what happens in season two and, like, you know, chart the direction this is all going? Or how do you guys want to do it? Can we yeah. just talk about season two and how utterly fucking brilliant everything about it is and, like, oh, Margaret yeah. Martindale, basically? Because, like, can we just do that? She's yeah, fucking it, incredible. See, season two introduces the Bennets, which are the other, like, they, they basically own the town of Bennett. Huh, funny that. Um... And they are basically the crime family that run weed in, you know, this area. And um, it's it's a, it's a drama that's basically a tragedy about changing times and about what people do to get ahead. And my God, um, it genuinely features some of the best acting I think I've ever seen in anything, hands down. As Rob says, the main villain of the season is just superb. Um mm-hmm. You know, uh, the range that she does is fantastic because she's the, she's the, she's she's the clan matriarch of the Bennets, and she can change from being homely and friendly to being ice cold, terrifying in the space of a single sentence. It's a real tour de force. And Straight up to the the weaponization of apple pie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, admittedly, that is moonshine. And, you know, once again, I return to my original point. This show hates food, and I don't know why I still like the show. (laughs) It's the the antithesis of Columbo. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the the plot for season two is basically um, a mining company wants to basically blow the top off a nearby mountain and, like, raid it for all the coal that's in it. To do it, they need to buy up a bunch of property to build access roads to get up there, though that's a plot point that isn't revealed until later on. And also going on during this is Boyd Crowder, in an attempt to reform, goes back to work in a mine because it's one of the few jobs it'll take an ex-con. And unfortunately, a bunch of guys there clock him for who he is and decide to use him as a scapegoat in a plan to basically steal a fucking huge amount of money from the mining company. And he's kind of... I mean, you say a huge amount. It's like it's like $60,000, $80,000, which, like, yeah, it is a lot of money, but it's not really a, that much money. It's like, yeah, it's like a weekly it's payroll, a, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's a weekly yeah. payroll. It's actually several weeks payroll. They make a plot point about that, about holding up the payments. And, um, oh, you know, they've yeah. got like an inside man with the armored car. And the key point is it's a lot of money for the people in that county. It's mm. very poor. Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of, uh, well, it's a, it's basically an overtone, really, of just like how poor Eastern Kentucky is and... Mm. um. Just the absolute shit that the uh, the people that live there have to go through just to just to survive. And, yeah, I mean it's never you know, it's never. You... Sorry, yeah, it's like I mean, yeah, I mean it's like Boyd Boyd's family is like, um, you know, they're running various like illegal trades down or like up from from various illegal like trades down to like just scams and shit. But like that's kind of the thing that you have to do if you're like from one of like an extremely working class family where you know the only industry in your town is coal and then if you don't want to do that what do you do i mean this and this exemplified exactly by what boyd does in well, what might end up many ends up being like a vain attempt at um sort of self redemption mm. but uh yeah, yeah like I just and, end up and... getting roped back straight into what he was doing beforehand like <laughs> fate forcing his hand so to speak 
Yeah, and I mean, in terms of like we we started talking earlier about like the class politics, and it's like this this season with the the mining company and the different you know and the difference between you know the people who sometimes it's made extremely explicit about you know the, the carpetbaggers and the people who come into town promising riches, yeah. and then like when everybody's bored in, they fuck them over and want to run away with the money. But it's like even more slowly than that, like you get such an incredible like look at you know this this incredibly poor working class culture and the way it creates class solidarity and the way some people use it right and the other way other people sort of run away with it and screw people over and it's like it's never like apart apart from in a few moments it's never hugely made like incredibly specific it's just but after you watch season two it's like you really do get like a really good sense of like mining class politics in in the US. It's like you know you listen to something like Pete Seeger after this, and it's like that's what this is. You know, like it's just, yeah, it's it's just fantastic, basically. And what's really good about it is this is all background to the real drama that's going on. It's just they'll live in it, you know, and therefore it features prominently. And it, that's a, it's a really it's just a really nice way to do it. And it all revolves, I mean, I mean, as Rob said, you know, using class solidarity, the, the clan matriarch of the Bennetts, she uses the uh, the reputation of her family and their long history, etc., to set up a situation where, she, in working with Boyd, she ends up owning all of the, the property that the, um, you know, mining corporation needs, and she parlays that into getting a massive fucking payout for her family by selling out all the people locally. Yeah, so, and, so she can get out, yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, it's it's real. It's something I've got to say. I've got to give it credit. It's like very well plotted, very tightly scripted, um, and just very well acted too. The other lesson of season two is that fail sons will always fuck everything up. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, shout out to both of the fail sons, by the way, because incredible. Oh yeah. yeah, no, it's it's absolutely fantastic from start to finish, like. The um one of the really nice things about Justified is it, it's it's concerned with legacy, and like one of the layers is is ju- is real and justified in being who he is. Are any of the characters justified in being who they are? Because they do a very good job of showing why characters are fucked up the way they are. Even the villains of season two, with the exception of the matriarch Mags Bennett, who's just kind of almost a force of nature in many ways. Like her yeah. sons, you see why they are the way they are, and it's uh it's it's definitely it, it's it's eye opening. And yeah. it's, it's portrayed with stri- with surprising sympathy and nuance is all I have yeah, to say. And for like uh, the the two failed children that we like we've alluded to have um, quite a direct and indirect reason to hate uh, Raylan Givens specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the Givens clan and the Bennett clan have you know been at war of one form or another for I think they say like a hundred years or something since prohibition. Yeah, explicitly. yeah something like that. Um, but uh, so not only is this like you know blood feud that goes back almost a century, but you've also got a, a direct example of this feud playing out uh, as uh, sort of explained th- uh, through the dialogue of once upon a time um, Raylan was playing uh, like minor league baseball or something like that, and yes, mm-hmm. minor league baseball, yeah. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it is that happens, but uh, lo- the long story short is Dicky. That- Dickie hits him in the head with with his pitch. Uh, yeah, that's it. And then like a fight breaks out, and when he comes to, Dickie's about to like stamp on his face, so he breaks his knee with with his bat. Yeah, yeah. yeah giving giving him like a, a permanent limp. Yeah, for twenty years. So like, Which... there's this antagonism that is just as soon as Raylan turns up to the 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 Bennett boys' house, uh, like the you know one of the first episodes, it's just the antagonism is just palpable. But it's also yeah. layered and nuanced because Raylan's uh, family and the Bennets have officially buried the blood feud some time back. And so they all kind of, there's bad blood, but they're all trying very hard not to get into fi- fight with each other. Because if they do, yeah. when will it stop? And uh, spoilers, at the end of the season, it, it spills out. There's no keeping a lid on it. Um, and it gets it gets really, really gr- grim. Um, so again, it's like when I say it's Shakespearean, it's real like... What does that it, even it, mean, though? 
Um, it's like, it's a Shakespearean tragedy in the sense that people are compelled into circumstances that are tragic, not necessarily by decisions that they themselves can control, but by the inheritance they have received, especially from their families, but more generally the world around them. And so in this case, um, like almost like the houses of Romeo and Juliet drive the, the romance of Romeo and Juliet to end up kind of, you know, dead. Uh, in this situation, it's the, the houses of Bennett and Givens ultimately collide to produce the situation we get in the, the last episodes Tri especially when it's driven by a fatal character flaw that is unavoidable because it's a product of the very circumstance that they end up you know strolling into this if that, that's the kind of dramatic kind of outline of what a shakespearean tragedy is season two are justified as a shakespearean tragedy so did, what, that... did he invent that did he were the, were the greeks not doing that before him uh shakespeare <laughs> in, in all seriousness yes shakespeare is um the first one to put together very particular elements in a certain way like the ancient greeks had tragedy and pathos and bathos and all the rest of the stuff that went with it but the shakespearean tragedy particularly in sorry. The, the act structure right yeah right sorry we've got six fucking seasons to talk about yeah all right, all right, right, the right, western like, yeah. fucking canon into this <laughs> <laughs> it's Once good folks justified, you have to go back to the 16th century <laughs> really yes <laughs> yeah um no like the 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 two fail sons in particular are fucking great you've got um Kuval, who's just a fucking just 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 a quite a He's simple hench. guy He's, he's just a big, he's, he's, he's yeah. a big himbo. Just a smart, he's a big himbo that really <laughs> likes to drink and fight. And, and smokes loads and thing. loads and loads of weed. Yes, because, well, yeah, it, it's there. It's available. Why the fuck not? Um, and you've got Dickie Bennett, who is like... It's just... It, the the, just the fun prick. thing about... He is, he's a just a prick, prick, he prick, thinks yeah. he thinks he's so much fucking bigger than he is in, like, every way. And that's what makes him such a good character. It's so fun to fucking hate him. And yeah. he's, a, he's a slippery guy who's used to being just smarter than the other people in the room, yeah. but who isn't smart. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a dumb guy, smart guy. Yeah. And, like, the fact that he's in the shadow of Margot. Um, yeah, who is, a, who is an, abs an actual, like, genius here. Yeah, yeah, who is like actually fucking cunning and like able to fucking really plan things out and set th get, if they'd listened to everything that she said and done everything properly, like it would have probably end up very differently. But I mean, because many... Dickie is a fucking scheming cunt and because Kuval's just not wanting to have to do all the fucking legwork because Dickie can't do it, then it, you know, it would all have been totally different, but and that's exactly and, what James was uh, saying. Like, it's just a, it's a force of circumstances upon them. And yeah, just and also, to, sorry, I'll still uh, go ahead. Just to exemplify just how fucking brutal Mags Bennett is in this, uh, Coover, uh, what is it? What is it? Coover does. Coover does something. I it's not that Coover does something, it's a dicky does something, but she straight up tells them, I would punish you for this dicky, but you're already half useless being a cripple, so it's your brother's got to pay. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And sh she brings out a fucking ball peen hammer, uh, round side down, and starts wailing on Coover's hand. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. Times. She leaves, it's okay. She leaves him his shooting hand. Yeah, she literally says that. And, and like, this it, is this is this is just to bring them in line um, because uh, it's like they the whole the whole um, like the ideology, if you like, of of the Bennett clan is that you don't go outside, like you don't mm. go to the cops, you don't um, they, you deal things get, in house. She does that because of the fucking oxy. Yeah, like they 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 fuck oh, up. Yeah, and the, the the reason the reason Raylan's like involved with them at all is because those two idiots hire a fucking pedophile. Yes, and like, and then in the first episode, he abducts someone's daughter, and you get oh, that man. great scene Speaking where, of like, great really... fucking characters, by the way, like incredible. The mm. daughter, the, the 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 girl that replaced the daughter. Yeah, yeah Loretta's Loretta's an incredible character, like, but Jeez. um, like the her dad, like, like when he sees the the pedophile guy like sniffing around his daughter, he calls a a tip line, and so they all turn up, and then. Because he like he the the, the Bennets come because he's grown weed on their land without the permission, and they come to like uh put put his foot in a bear trap as punishment for that, and he thinks that it's because they like he called the police, and like accidentally like tips his hand, and so Mags has him killed, mm -hmm. 
Um, actually, it doesn't even have him killed. Kills him herself. She kills yeah. him herself. Yeah. Poison yeah. moonshine. Poison but, moonshine. Um, yeah. Like the there's a great scene where because the guy like the guy kidnaps the girl and then they're at a, like Raylan catches up with them at a petrol station mm-hmm. and just like and he's he's taking the petrol pump out of the guy's car and the guy comes back out the the store and he's like what are you doing are you stealing gas he's like yeah you got me i'm stealing gas i don't know why i do it i can afford to pay for it myself and then he just sprays the guy with petrol and the guy like they have this this great conversation where he has to explain the concept of a firearm and why they why the word fire is included to this guy who's covered in petrol and threatening do you to shoot know him. why it's called a firearm yes it's so fucking it's, it's incredible great. It's they so do good. the show the show does a great line in like absolutely like no mark dipshits Oh, there's yeah. just <laughs> countless. There's a countless amount of them throughout the, the six seasons, and they're all great. Like it's it's, it's, it's really great. good. It's great because even goes further because the guy's like bullshit. I I can you know the sparks really far away from it, and he's like no no it's the gas that burns. And besides, and during this time he's buying time for his partner to walk up behind him and point a gun at his head, and he says, and besides, even if you succeed, and he nods, and the guy looks around and realizes that there's another deputy with a gun drawn on him. It's just it's all really well done. The physical, like busy work of the scenes is just impeccably, impeccably well, drafted out. That one that at that that point he actually says, like, you know, ordinarily I would have shot you by now, but I'm getting tired of the amount of paperwork. Because paperwork. <laughs> <That's laughs> so there's a great there's a great bit in the first um in the first season. Where like every time he shoots someone, like his boss has to tell him, like like his boss Art has to tell him that like you know the <laughs> assistant district attorney's wanting to like d- discuss his shooting with him, and uh, and he's like, oh, I, I, why do they even give us guns? And Art's like, well, put it this way: if you were in kindergarten and you bit a kid each week, they'd start to think of you as a biter. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, also there's so many fucking good lines like that in in oh. like, across the whole ser- uh, mm. season uh, series even. It's also it's also really great because we play up the whole like are you gonna get invested by the AUSA and then he finally sits down in the office with him and the AUSA is basically is there to say right so you did this shooting and that's cool and all but unfortunately you're sleeping with the only witness yeah. um, so we we have to let Boy Crowder go the only witness is someone you're banging and you realize the AUSA is just there to cover his ass <laughs> and it's like you know uh, you can be a cop and get away with shooting people it turns out uh, which is a really nice bit. Um, but yeah, it's uh, in in season two in particular. Um, there are some just absolute belt of lines threaded throughout. There's actually uh, well, uh, before we move off the first episode, there there's a, an absolutely fucking incredible scene. Um, I don't know if it's the first. It's one of the first scenes with Loretta in anyway, where she's in the weed shed. Yes. And the pedo guy turns up and is like trying to fucking chat her up, and she like. Uh, basically, like fucking hypnotizes him, you know, because he says something about a period, and she's like, "Oh, do you think we're going to talk about it?" Eh? And then what? And then like you'll you'll touch me, and I'll say, "Oh, don't touch me there, it tickles." And look at you, you've stopped now, like you, if you're in a dream, like a spell's being cast, and you don't know how, to, you don't know what to do. And then she like fucking just slaps him and runs off, and he like leads him into a booby trap, and he ends up with loads of fish and hooks stuck in his face. <laughs> yes. Absolutely incredible, like yeah. yeah. Really uh, sets just, her up as one of the one of the the smartest characters in the show. But yeah. they also show her they they show her as being very naive because here's the thing here's Mag Bennett's flaw. Mag Bennett always wanted a daughter. She wanted someone who she could feel would be a true inheritor of herself, and she's got three sons. Her elder son is the local police officer, and he's corrupt as shit, and he's like the competent one of the family, but he's not a daughter. And the two younger ones are dipshits, and you get the feeling that a lot of her frustrations have been vented on them, which is partly why they've ended up the way they are. But she really wanted a daughter, and now she's murdered this man, and wouldn't you know, he had a nice young daughter who's about the age that Mags can relate to, so she adopts her, basically. Yeah, adopts without her and telling tells her that her dad's gone to work in a farm. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> your, she literally does she says your father's yeah. down south taking some business taking care of some business for us and uh unfortunately she's so sweet on her that kuva you know who's who kuva who desperately wants his mother's love like here's the thing like alice said earlier that she she like breaks kuva's hand after she's done he's crying and and like hugging her lap and apologizing to her 
to this woman who's just like broken and brutalized yeah. his hand and and like throughout the show it, 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 she treats him with nothing but contempt he gets into a fight with Raylan at one point which is like you know they're eventually like Hoover don't get into a fight with a federal you'll catch him years and Raylan's response to this is to take his badge off and set it aside it's like if you want to go I want to go <laughs> and then they then they fight and Hoover starts Co- Raylan's winning initially and then Loretta walks in and distracts him for just a second and Hoover gets the advantage and to be, to break Hoover off she just picks up a, a, a fucking spade and starts whacking him over the head with it they're telling him to stop it and right that is just a little tableau that shows you how she's kind of raised him and he notices that she's so sweet on loretta and so he decides in because he's reckless stupid and also just wants to to hurt her back like he feels like she's hurt him he reveals to loretta that they killed her dad he does it indirectly but he does it and that's what kicks oh, off the final act, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, they, he keeps uh, her dad's watch, doesn't he? Which went from when they yeah. chuck his body yeah. down down a mine shaft. Yeah, well, we I, to, like, um... the, I just want to say, like the the like the cowboy tropes, like the west uh, the western tropes throughout the entire series. Like, obviously, it's a cowboy TV show, but they're I mean, fucking it's, fantastic. It is... It is a Western, like, yeah. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. but, like, it's just, like, I mean, like, and all the, like, the poster to Tombstone in Art's office. Um, there's a there's a bit in one of the latest seasons where someone's like watching uh, one of the I can't remember what's uh, I think it's the Three Tens of Yuma like the the sixties or seventies version or whatever yeah. is on the yeah. TV and stuff like that just like sprinkled throughout the show just nice little touches like that on top of the like it's, mine shafts and so on. It's it's in many ways a kind of I don't I'm, bear with me on this it's a bit of a postmodern western because what makes it a western is that all the people in the show are like culturally and semi-consciously playing up to the Western tropes that they've been raised with. And that's what gives them, like there's even a bit where Raylan gives one of the best lines in the entire series. Um, and when he gets later investigated for it, he actually admits he saw it on a Western on TV yeah. when he was younger. It's <laughs> like it's... On, the, on the Johnny Carson show. Well, you know, but it was, a, it was a gangster story, not a Western story. But okay, okay, but actually, actually what makes it's... this show uh, postmodern is that uh, Paul Mason doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway we need we need to rewind um because i did mention that like when, when i was talking about season one i said boyd sends a dipshit to kidnap ava we need yeah. to talk about that dipshit um because he's another like re- he is he is the the ur example of the fucking like no mark dipshit that i was talking <laughs> yeah. about earlier yes it's dewey crow uh he has oh. heil hitler tattooed on his fucking neck <laughs> and he is he is every inch the kind of man you would expect to have Heil Hitler tattooed on his fucking neck. But frankly, he's just the <laughs> yeah. stupidest motherfucker alive. He and also it's has hilarious. He also has gator teeth as a necklace, which he poached and ate himself. So uh he's great. He's just genuinely fantastic. The guy who acts him is an absolute standout actor. He's absolutely nothing like the character whatsoever. <laughs> it's yeah, he's Australian. Australian. Yeah. It's like Jesus Christ, yeah. he did not like in terms of yeah. They're so good. Dewey Crow, the, the thing that we've managed to do with the show as it goes on is you realise Dewey Crow is stone cold stupid. He is the dumbest motherfucker you'll ever meet and he's entirely a product of his upbringing and environment making him into the absolute, like, just buffoon. But here's the thing, he's the comic relief, but mm. he's the comic relief by just being completely hapless and playing it completely straight yeah, and no gets, one else uh, taking him seriously. He, get, he gets kicked out of Boyd Crowder's ch- uh, new church because they, got, they caught him yeah. wha- uh, spanking the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're not doing wanking at what this was he gets bamboozled into like uh providing evidence on boyd by just like Raylan tells him he's deputized him so he has to yeah. like, tell him what's going on um it, like season two he's he's uh, he's on an oxy bus coming back from florida isn't he? he's going to get paid two hundred dollars yeah, 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 for yeah. going to florida and picking up some pills and then they get ambushed but he recognizes one of the one of the guys that robs the bus so he, he he's trying to buy a ski mask in Kentucky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and what's great, what's great is the store owner is like just straight up going, "Listen, do you want? I should just call the cops now and get it over with." Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in, so in in when he can't buy a ski mask, he ends up buying a cowboy hat and robbing the two guys back, but pretending to be railing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's me, Deputy Marshal Raylan Givens. Yeah. Yeah. And he just and he quotes things that Raylan has said to him. He, like, he finishes by going, y'all ought to go back to poaching gators is uh, yeah. safer, which is what <laughs> Raylan said to him in the very first encounter and makes no sense in context. Um, 
But that even, I mean, here's the thing, this is how well it's all woven together, because that then leads to the local sheriff gets a call and is like, oh, Raylan Givens has robbed these guys of Oxy, so, and it's the Bennett guy, so he calls up Raylan and does this whole, you know how sometimes you think a man oh, might not yeah, be the man? Like, yeah, they've got, you stand and talk to him and like, uh, they've got the witness, you know, the witness said it was you and all this, and Raylan just goes and opens the car door and says to the, the woman, like, was it me that robbed these guys? She's like, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and she actually says oh, she actually looks him up and down and goes oh lord no and he shuts the door in her face, which is what makes it even better because Timmy Oliphant is hot he is he's annoyingly hot yeah he's yeah, about, um... about on par with Johnny Lee Miller in elementary who's also annoyingly hot <laughs> but yeah so like season two is just the Bennett's like fucking around like Mags gets out of the game but then like has to go back in because like uh it's also because she doesn't know just... what else to do with her life, basically. Well, it's because Dickie's such a fuck up. Yeah. Also, that yes. Like Dickie won't like Dickie and me. Like she declares a truce, tells Boyd he can have all the like he can run all the crime in Harlem, but not the weed business. And then Dickie immediately goes to Boyd and tells him, like, you know what I mean, that he, he can get yeah. fucked because he's going to take over all the the crime. And so they um they have a great scene where they rob. They rob Dicky as he's selling weed to um, Hot Rod. Hot Rod. Yeah. Dunham. It Rodney Hot Rod Dunham. Dunham. Yeah. Up yeah. from Memphis. <laughs> yeah. But like Boyd turns up, robs him, and like uh, Hot Rod's like, I'll find out who you are. And Boyd's like, well, I would hope so because you just bought some of my best weed and like has his guys like load his car with the weed he'd bought and just takes the money that like was meant for Dicky. And so and then hot- Dicky. And Hot Rod on the spot is just like, yeah, all right. Like, yeah. Yeah, he, just, he, he sees away the wind's blowing and goes with it. It's very yeah. good. And then, like, to retaliate, because, like, Raylan's dad is part of uh, Boyd's crew at that point. Mm-hmm. So, like, and Dickie clocks him. So Dickie goes uh, with a fucking, like, another peak dipshit. I can't remember his name. Uh, but, I like, can't remember. He's a minor character. Good character, yeah. but minor character. It's but not um, Mesa, does it? No, it's it, not. It's not it, Mesa. Uh, is it not? It's not. No. Oh no! Hang on, Wade Mesa. No, that's the other one at the end of the seat. Right? Yes. Okay. But um, they then they end up killing uh Raylan's aunt. Aunt Helen, who so yeah. right? Okay, Raylan's Raylan's family. Brief little like primer. Uh, he was raised by a mother named Francis and Arlo. Arlo is a Vietnam Vietnam veteran, and as the series goes on, you find out he's very clearly got PTSD from it, but he's also, like, an asshole. Um, these things may not be unrelated. It's hard to unpick it all. Um, his mother was a good influence in his life, but she died, you know, when he was young, and um, Arlo remarried with Helen, and Helen did everything she could to get him out of Kentucky and get him out of his father's, like you know, um, radius, and that's what's kind of maybe saved him. And it leads to the best season in the entire show, the best scene in the entire show, actually. Um, because obviously, like, you know, he's come back. Um, she's still trying to get him to just leave Kentucky because she knows it's not good for him. She gets killed by Dickie Bennett, who's looking for Arlo because, you know, these things go around. And Raylan goes down a deep, dark hole, and he goes and grabs Dickie and takes him out into the woods and is getting ready to execute him. And... You know, he's talking about Helen. Like, Dickie says something about how he didn't mean to, you know, hurt her or something, and he just tells him to shut the fuck up. He doesn't know who she was. And he starts talking about her and what she wanted for him and what she meant to him and how she wanted him to be something different. And doing this, he reminds himself that this isn't... She wanted him to not be this person, to not be a Gibbons. And so he talks himself out of shooting Dickie and lets Dickie go. And it's just... It's so powerful. It's so well done. But him putting a gun on Dickie is what convinces Mags to... uh that there is going to be a reckoning, essentially, and it's just—it's it's tragic. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. And um, even with these plot spoilers, watch watch the goddamn show. Yeah. Watch season two. Like you will watch get all of it. Fuck it. But like, yeah, season two is. I mean, it, they're not all masterpieces all season, but season two is. Yeah, some of the best television ever. Just, yeah, I mean, we could spend this whole episode, and we <laughs> we have fucking spent. have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should we move on to season three? Yeah. Yeah. By all means. Yeah, season three. Um, the the main sort of through thread in that is, uh, what happened to Mags Bennett's money? Yes. After she died. 
Um, and like, and introduces a man with the most ridiculous name on God's earth, <laughs> Mister Quarles. <laughs> Robert Quarles, yeah. Late, lately of Band of Brothers. Oh yeah, yeah, he's in there. Mm-hmm. Neil McDonough, mm. who has a weird, weird face, but does wildly he's psychotic so criminal very well. Yeah, it's yeah, brilliant. he's 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 exiled from the Detroit mob for um, like brutally murdering a a prostitute, isn't it? And like a, a male prostitute. Not, yeah. not, yeah, yeah, yeah. An advanced nonsense, basically. Yeah, um, and so he comes to Kentucky. Uh, with the idea that he's gonna like industrialize the the oxy like pill mill mm-hmm. system, um, and he makes the mistake of like attracting Raylan's attention, and like it all just goes to shit. Uh, but it does. But, but the, the great thing though is that uh, he teams up with uh, Win Duffy, so Jerry yeah. Burns stars quite quite heavily in this season. <laughs> yeah. And what's so great about it is we've put a lot of work in and setting up that Win Duffy is a bad dude. And then Robert Qualls comes in and scares the shit out of Win Duffy, yeah. <laughs> and it's so well done. Yeah, there's a point in there's a point in season two where, um, like hitmen try to kill Raylan and um, Winona, Winona, uh, and it like it's assumed automatically that like they're doing it to try and get at Raylan for one of the many like things he's done to annoy criminals, but it's actually uh, her ex husband. Yeah, had like arranged to have her killed by Win Duffy, and then back tried to back out of it, and Win Duffy wouldn't have it. Um, so Raylan goes like goes to Win Duffy, and like fucking um. Oh god! I mean? like, yeah, basically... yeah, yeah. The next one's like, yeah. coming faster. No, that's that's no, that's um, later. That's season that's three. That's later. Oh, yeah, he, he goes J- to J- him. Burns, he yeah. tells he tells them like um. You know, like to basically to fuck off, but like the, he tells Gary, the ex husband, to like to just leave and not come back. It's like, personally, I'd leave the country, but you'd best get out of town. Um, and then when he runs into them in season three, um, they end up like drawing his ire. So he, he goes to, he, when he goes there, he meets, when he meets Robert Quarles for the first time in Win Duffy's like Winnebago. <laughs> he lamps win, the Winnebago lamps win is such a lovely touch, by the way. I love the yeah. Winnebago every time it's oh, there. So good. <laughs> but he he fucking he decks he decks Win Duffy and then pull like takes a single bullet out of his gun and like drops it on him and tells him the next one's coming faster. And then they then use that bullet to murder Gary later on to to frame Raylan, which is like one of the one of the great like episodes where um he's trying you know what I mean like the. The police are after him for this murder, and the FBI are after him for supposedly, yeah, uh, for some inter- other, yeah. Inter- interfering with their investigation of yeah. um, Quarles as like boss or whatever. And it's great, like just all the back and forth. But because um, the the FBI, the guy, the the, the main FBI guy is um, Ned Ryerson from Groundhog Day. Who is just such a fucking like <laughs> such a like a yeah soft he's prick. such a pr- yeah such a <laughs> he's just so prick, slimy yeah yeah um but yeah the uh War- Robert Quarles is like he-, he starts off he's like you know he's super slick and like got everything together and that and then as things start going wrong he just spirals out of control and by the end the end of the the season he's like popping pills like he's, sm- like he's smoking um oxy out of a piece of tin foil and sucking the gas in with a straw it's yeah. um, it's a look but there's and- that there's that <laughs> scene where he's just sat like just like crunching the pills out of the bottle yeah mm. <laughs> To make yeah, he's he's it's it's very much down. like you know the old adage of uh, when you're a dealer like don't use your own product. It's like this is what happens when you do like start going down that particular rabbit hole. But it's also because yeah. he has his own like weird backstory with like the sort of an adoptive father who's like a true like mafia crime uh, kingpin, and it's like, well, it's like even the mafia kingpin, isn't it? Of like yeah, yeah, but like even for most of the, with most yeah, of the show. Theo Theo Tornan, Theo yeah, Tornan. yeah. He has a human ear that he whispers into. Um, yeah. What does he but say? Yeah. What does he say? Does it matter? It's a fucking <laughs> ear. <laughs> yeah. Season three also introduces Elson Limehouse. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Who um, runs Nobles Hollow. Which is the, historically, basically was the, the hollow of the freemen. Um, you know, freed black slaves, um, you know, settled it. And their whole thing is they just want to be left alone. Yeah. Um, and all but these also fucking he, white people keep turning up. Yeah. But he also he also runs like a, a bank for criminal elements. Mm-hmm. And is like a, an information broker. Um, but it turns out like, you know, the rumor is that he's got Mags's money. Um, that it might be buried under a church, which is like an old folk tale that everyone everyone in Harlan's heard as a kid and that. Um, and so everyone's trying to work out how they how they can get that money off him. And then it transpires at the end that the money was actually uh given to Loretta. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Obviously it's um, also like the person who deserves it by far the most. Like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting because all the characters, like like we said, they've all got their different sides. Even Quarles, like his backstory, is like amazingly fucked up and does sympathize him a tiny little bit, but he's still a psycho. Because his whole yeah. thing is that his father was lieutenant for Theotonin, and on the side he was bluntly he was selling his son out to men, and Theotonin found out about it, um, executed his father in front of him, and adopted him. But unfortunately, the psychological scars of all of that and being raised by a psychopath mob boss made Didn't, him the uh, way he, he killed, is. He killed his dad himself. Is, did he? Did he? I, I, yeah. I, I, I might have misread that scene, but yeah, sure. Um, but either way, Theotonin made it happen. Um, so it did a lot of it did a lot of damage, and uh, like it makes Quarles the like quite scary guy he is. And then you contrast him with Limehouse, who is probably the smartest person in the entire series. I think actually, um, yeah. apart from maybe Max you know, Bennett. He, yeah. Well. I mean, Maybe. yeah, Mags Bennett has to contend with her dipshit sons, and that, that's, that's her, yeah, her yeah. flaw is that she didn't raise raise them to be not dipshits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it also they get like a a bigger role for um for Jim Beaver, who is for you, who you recognise from fucking everything, <laughs> yeah. quite frankly. Um, but he was he he appeared in season two as the like security at the mine. The, yeah, he, like the guys he, wanted Boyd to rob, and when Boyd like, uh, Boyd like fucking outmaneuvered the the guys, so that they blew themselves up, and like Boyd managed to get away with like most of the money. Um, and so he tells like Shelby, uh, he asks Shelby to tell everyone that like you know, uh, Boyd was a hero, and so they could bring him back in season three because uh. Limehouse like says that you know if Quarles wants um like wants more power in Harlan he needs to back the the sheriff, mm-hmm. and so Boyd gets Shelby to run against the guy as sheriff because Quarles try because here's the thing Quarles approaches Boyd and tries to buy him out and that's where you get your big dialogue about carpetbaggers basically. Yeah. Because um, yeah. that's literally what Quarles is. He's he's you know the normal yeah, carpetbaggers yeah. coming down how to exploit the local poverty. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You, um, now, Mister Quarles, do you know what a carpet bagger is? <laughs> it's so good, man. It's <laughs> we just keep honestly, referencing this all... shit, and like, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna be hearing uh, Limehouse saying Mister Quarles till the day I die. Like, it just yeah. reverberates around my brain. Yeah, but yeah. So, like, um, I think like Shelby loses the election, but then. Uh, Boyd had a contingency and had gotten like the uh, I can't remember the sheriff's name. He's a he fucking dickhead, like. But he tracked down the, the the sheriff's estranged sister and got her a job on the like county commissioners in the county commissioner's office or whatever. So that when like when the the sheriff then wins, like is reelected, it turns out the result has to be thrown out because like he had a family member working in the uh, like. Uh, the office that was like managing the election which can i just say is the most true to life fucking thing i think i've ever <laughs> seen politically like uh the united states is full of that shit it's really quite something yeah and so there's a bunch of like double crosses and stuff and the, the, there's a plan to boyd's planning to rob a bank where uh limehouse supposedly has his money quarrels turns up to kill uh boyd but uh when Duffy like double crosses quarrels and sets off a car bomb, which doesn't kill him, 
but that like knocks Boyd out and then uh, Trooper Tom Bergen, who's been like a recurring character from the state police and is friends with Raylan, gets killed by Raylan's dad. And yeah. then at the end of the season, it turns out that like he didn't actually wreck, like he didn't see who it was that he shot. He just saw a cop in a hat standing over yeah. like threatening Boyd and so killed him. It's the only see. This is the other thing. All the other seasons end with some variation of, um, you know, in the deep dark hills of eastern Kentucky. That's the place where I trace my bloodline. Um, it's very red on a hillside gravestone. You'll never leave Harlan alive. That's for one season that doesn't end with that, and it's very poignant for it because he's talking. He's talking to his ex question mark Winona. Ex ish at his, this point, I think. Yeah, yeah, who's pregnant with his daughter, but has recognised she can't live with Raylan because he's just too much. And um, he tells of his whole story and he says he, he just thought he saw a man with a hat. And then he turns to leave and as he's leaving, he puts his hat on and she sees it and you see the penny drop for her. And that's it. Yeah. And it's one of the most powerful endings in like any TV season I've ever seen. As as, as Raylan really realises, like, because this is the thing, the show ex- really heavily goes in on why is Raylan the angriest man alive? And the answer is look at his family, look at his circumstance, look at who he was raised to be and is struggling not to be. We should and like, uh, we should it's, also it's add real... that, like at no point in the TV in the entire series uh, does uh, Raylan ever call Arlo dad ever. Yeah, not once. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the only other like major incident that'll come back later in that season is um, fucking Tom Cruise's brother is like the fucking pimp at the local brothel. <laughs> Is, it, is that oh, really yeah. Tom Cruise's brother? Or are you just yeah. like making shit up? What no, the Tom, fuck? Tom Cruise's brother. Uh, fucking Summit Mapatha, isn't it? I can't remember his name. Uh, All right. All right. So Tam Cruise then. Uh, <laughs> is the, uh, yeah, you know, he's running the local whorehouse and things get crazy there. Go yeah. on, Jimmy. Um, and he's like, he, f- he, turn- he first turns up. Um, I think it's the episode. Oh, it's the episode with the the oxy bus being robbed. Yeah, mm-hmm. Delroy. Um, Delroy. Yeah, like the oxy bus gets robbed, and then in like I think part of the retaliation of that or something is like someone shoots another, like shoots a doctor who's writing scripts, and a couple of the like. Yeah. Um, a couple of his girls are in the room with the doctor and one, Ellen May, is hiding under the desk when the shooting happens and is a witness but isn't spotted. And, like, he insists that she has to go, like, and get more oxy, even though she's just watched her friend get killed. Um, and when she goes, she sees that the alt- the alternative oxy clinic is being run by one of the shooters. And then, um, like, Raylan turns up to talk to her with Ava... And, uh, like, Delroy tries to, like, you know, Delroy comes into a trailer and starts insisting that they leave and Raylan, like, basically just fucking batters him. Oh, it's, it's, even, it's even better than that. Uh, if I recall correctly, this is the scene where Delroy pulls a knife and Raylan looks at the knife and goes, well, shit, and just pulls a jacket back to Raylan's gun. I don't have a knife. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is uh, just very, very cool. Yeah, but then when the guy, well, like, the guy goes outside and as they're leaving, Raylan, like, fucking punches him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And like uh tells him he's got to look after Ellen May. But then oh, I think that is there's a there's something we haven't mentioned which is kind of important. So Raylan gets back together with his ex. Meanwhile, Ava Crowder, after season one, Raylan, when he gets back with his ex, she's obviously hurt by this. And she you know, Ava Crowder needs to support herself and Boyd appears to be reformed. So in season two it turns out she's let Boyd come well, in as a lodger. Boyd um Boyd helps save her life at the end of season one. Yeah. In Bulletville. So she decides that he's clearly not all bad. And long story short, they fall in love. Um, which then leads to when Boyd's setting up his criminal empire, Ava agrees to go along with it and be part of it. And uh, this then leads to the thing that you're about to talk about. Go on, Jamie. Um, yeah, so then like later on, in, like a few episodes later, Delroy is using the girls uh, from Audrey's, which is the name of the brothel. He's using the girls from Audrey's to commit bank robberies. And, uh, like, Ellen May is the... Like, Ellen May and two other girls that go to rob a bank. One of them gets shot. 
it's a it's a check cashing shop, not a bank, but close enough. All right. Well, they but they get um. They they take the girl. The girl who was shot dies in the van as they're making the getaway, and uh, they take her up to like a slurry pond. And then Delroy shoots the other girl, but Ellen May like manages to get away, and she goes to Ava for help. And then so like uh, Johnny Crowder, who's like in a wheelchair at that point, but still involved in the criminal enterprise, he. Um, Tells Ava she can't be taken in strays, so Ava phones Delroy and offers to sell Ellen May back to him. But then when he turns up, she kills him with a shotgun. And so Ellen May and Ava like dump his body down a mine shaft. Mm -hmm. And Ava, Ava previously said to Boyd she only had one rule, which was no running horse, uh, in her own words. Um, and at this point, she goes to Boyd and says she wants to break that rule. She wants to run them to make sure the girls are treated right. And there's this whole there's this whole thing about the gravity of circumstance in this show because Ava talks about how she's going to run the girls right, but as you see as it goes on, Ava herself ends up not exactly treating the girls right to put it gently, um, without being like a super villain about it. It's like you know this show is very it, there is a Marxist reading of this about material circumstances shaping people and the extraordinary changes that are necessary to get someone out of the gravity of economics, and this show does a very good job of illustrating it with parallels essentially. Mm. so yeah so season four is yeah. um do we um do, do we need to take a minute because we, we, we spoke about all these like fucking antagonists and stuff we haven't spoke about like supporting cast as in the other deputies yeah i think we do because especially for season four um it's kind of important particularly we need to talk about the legend that is tim gutterson Oh, Tim Gutterson fucking <laughs> like uh oh, it, it stands out amongst a load of other really good characters to be honest. Yeah, the, the show the show centers four marshals. It, show, it centers the boss, um Art, who is brilliant. He's he's like playing off the good old boy stereotype, but he's just uh you can tell he's a fucking good marshal and he has some of the best lines in the show and his relationship with Raylan is basically just taking no shit from him whatsoever um but also being stuck with him and it's is very very well done um then there's uh rachel who is a bit kind of cold and a bit stiff but you start to find out why as the show goes on and then there is uh tim gutterson who is an ex uh what was it u.s special forces sniper was it yeah uh, uh, ranger, ranger sniper ranger, yeah. yeah oh ranger sniper and yeah on, on that note i want to i want to re remind everyone of the of like the number one Tim Gutterson quote, which is, I can't carry a tune, I don't know how to shoot a basketball, and my high end writing is barely legible, but I don't miss. Don't miss, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my, my personal favourite line by him is, uh, he, at one point he has to tail Raylan, like he's been, stu he's been put on Raylan for protection, but can also... I just, um, I have this. Come, yeah. <laughs> oh, go on, go on, drop it. Call the front desk, see if I can get you a car. I got a sleeping bag in the trunk. You're not going to try to go out the window or anything while I'm gone? No. Not right now, I'm beat. Plus, you got your car here. Even if I got to jump on you, you'd be right behind me. But you will eventually. Eventually, yes. Yes, why would you do that? Well, I got to talk to some people, alone. So, either you let me go, or I'm going to have to give you the slip. I love this shit. This shit makes me hard. <laughs> that's my favorite quote that's so it sells you it's I his mean, entire personality definitely number two at least at the very least for me um but yeah what's also really nice is again with all the characters existing to kind of give you elements about Raylan Raylan is set up as being like this really good shot he's not actually a brilliant shot he's 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 good he's, just a, he's quick a quick draw, draw. he's, a, he's quick a quick draw, draw. Yeah. whereas Gutterson is not a quick draw but he is a very good shot and yeah. it's again, it's just a nice little contrast to kind of help fill it out and to, you know, help you understand who Raylan is and why he is the way he is. So yeah, I think um, season four is where the quality starts to take a little dip, though. Um, I I don't especially I, I, especially in regard to Tim. I think he gets like because they try to, they try to give him more to do in this season, and it's like it's all kind of shit because it's all just like oh he was in the army. What if every single aspect of his character was about army? Yeah, <laughs> like Boyd, Boyd's like uh, uh, someone Boyd knew in Kuwait turns up, like a former military policeman, um, and then like obviously 
uh, Tim has to run into him so they can like have an antagonism so that Tim can pair off with his own villain at the end of the season. And it turns out like, you know, one of Tim's friends is like uh, from the army is now a junkie and goes to a, like a, a drug dealer who was also in the army. And then like uh, Boyd's guy, um, can't, Colt, is it? Colt. Yeah. Colt, yeah, 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 Colt. Yeah, he robs that like army drug dealer and in the process kills Tim's like army mate. And so like they have to have an army showdown at the end and it's just like there's it's kind of like one note, I think. It's Tim's a little a much more it's a interesting little poor, character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think like so what they essentially use Tim for is they use it you see this is this is oblique, but it's there, which is the whole thing with Colt and by extension Tim is to fill you in on bits of Boyd, bizarrely. Um, it's to it's to talk a bit about essentially different forms of inherited trauma and what they're looking at is they're looking at the military angle that's like part of the subplot of season four it's not overstressed but it's like taken as a matter of fact background and i agree i think they underwrote tim but i think what they were trying to do with it isn't too bad because it's there what they're trying to say is like yeah okay look so on one hand boyd was like a veteran and stuff but that isn't necessarily like why Boyd is the way he is and they're kind of they're blocking it out like that I, I agree though I don't think that part's as sharply written as the rest I do think the rest of the season holds up quite well though it's also nah, a nice it's... change of pace the problem the problem with season four is it doesn't have like a good villain no but it's got a good mystery it, it's like the 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 plot is like uh, um, a guy died by falling out of a yes, plane in the it... 80s yeah, it's basically like a redoing of the DP DB Cooper, who was an actual bank robber yeah. who dro- jumped out of an actual plane, and it's sort of a retelling ish of that story. If you're familiar with, I it. mean, it's, it's definitely inspired by that. Like, yeah, but so this guy Drew Thompson um, supposedly witnessed Theo Tornan, who was uh, mentioned in like the previous season, uh, supposedly saw him murder someone and also like shot Theo in the eye. Yeah, he, he saw Theo murder a federal witness, and he also, in, esca- in the process of escaping from Theo, shot him in the eye, um, flew with uh, his fellow co-conspirator Waldo Truth over Kentucky, and threw Waldo Truth out of the plane uh, to fake his own death, yeah, and, and vanished. Waldo Truth is an incredible name as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of names in this. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's where's Waldo? It, you know, that's, that's, why, that's what he's ripping off of. Yeah. Yeah. But again, this mystery, um, this mystery is brought up because it turns out, um, like Raylan's dad was central to the mystery and hid like evidence of the mystery in the walls of the house. Um, and it's like it's just a little too convenient. It's a Not little too contrived it, it, to like cram, and it crams like, t- yeah, it's just. It, yeah. it, it's, it's a series it's of extraordinary TV, circumstances it's... are called. Yeah, hang on, no, 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 like hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold, hold on. In defense of the writers, it actually makes perfect sense. Bo Crowder and Raylan's dad were the ones in charge of the whole crime area when this guy comes rolling in with a whole bunch of cocaine to get rid of. Of course he'd be talking to them in particular. No, because it's, it's stated that like they built their criminal enterprise off the money they got from selling that guy's coke. Yeah, but that's but that's where they expanded it. Remember, they were running protection rackets separate from that, and that's also established in this in the thing. So yeah, and so they hid Drew Chomp- Thompson, but Raylan's dad, being you know a bit of a person who plays angles, rather than f- burn the bag and the ID in it, he you know he hides it in case he needs it later. That's all fine. Like that all fits. Like, you know, there's not that bit isn't badly written. I'll stand up for that. It fits with the universe they've established. There's much worse writing in the last two seasons, frankly, than this bit. Um, we're gonna will... have, so we're going to have such a fight over season six, like I'm telling you that yeah. now. <laughs> oh, I, I can tell. <laughs> but yeah, um, like this, it, so, um, like, yeah, they're looking for this missing guy and it's sort of like, it brings together a bunch of like characters that existed before and um, like, it's not, I mean, the thing is, it's it's like one of the worst seasons, but it's not terrible. Like it's still it's still worth a watch, but like four and five were a bit of a slog to get through on on my like what must be my like seventh or eighth three watch for this, <laughs> um, and they were like it took me a full week to get through four and five, whereas I did six in like a day. Yeah, um, mm. yeah, I'll, but, I can drive with that. 
But um, the the problem the problem with four is it doesn't have a good villain. Like the the, yeah. the main sort of antagonist by the end is uh, Pickle. No, not Picker. It's um, oh fucking hell, man! What's he called? You see, I can't even remember his name because he's Augustine. Oh, Nicky, Nicky Augustine. Nicky Augustine. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting ahead. Who, so. Nicky Augustine is just a prick, but yeah. not an interesting prick. Do you know what yeah. I mean? He's he's just like you could you could go to like any kind of like fucking fucking knobhead convention on the planet and throw a dart and hit 10 <laughs> guys like this. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. he's really, he, they try to establish him as like, oh, you, you got to hate, you got to hate this guy by having him just be incredibly misogynistic to Ava at length for, for one scene. But it, mm. it's just not, it's not a patch on like the Bennett's or Robert Quarles or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? He turns up late in the season. He doesn't really fucking do anything. Um, his henchmen are more interesting than he is. Yeah. Like that fucking uh, YOLO. Yolo, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a great because, <laughs> yeah, um, fucking what do you call him? Pat Oswalt turns yeah, up Patton as Oswald, Const- yeah. Constable mm-hmm. Bob, who, who is another great like, name. Yeah, who is who is an, another one of like the the like no mark dipshits, except this one's on the side of the law. Yeah, yeah. like constable, like constable is um, it's an elected position, but nobody runs for it, so he was elected unopposed. Um. And he has to like pay for all of his gear and everything out of his own pocket. Uh, he's the, he he's the bit, Walmart greeter of cops. Yeah. yeah, he gets hardly any money for like holding the position, but he's allowed to charge less for serving papers than the state police are. <laughs> and so that's that's how he makes a living off it. But he is such a tryhard and and also an atrocious fucking nerd. Um, and yeah, keeps, and yeah, he keeps yeah. getting disarmed by try like he keeps getting overpowered by people he has the drop on by trying to encourage them to pull a gun on him so he can show his knife moves off. It's just <laughs> that kind of like that kind of like fucking you know like oh yeah I read a book on special forces once drop me yeah. in Afghanistan aye. kind of guy. You don't know what I mean? The man has shields He's... and velcro. Aye, yeah, like, <laughs> huge, huge like your dad vibe like. Yeah, well, what, there's a great there's a great scene where he gets into a fucking gunfight with two rich guys. I think oh, it's this so season, good. isn't it? With the yeah. fucking AK. <laughs> yeah, because he talks earlier about having a go bag. He talks about, yeah. I've got a go bag with an AK. And he's saying this in press reel, and it's like, well, you just hold on to that. And then later on, they like run them off. He comes to talk to them at their property. Um, and They, uh, they, they fuck him right off. Yeah. In technical mm-hmm. terms. And so, <laughs> so he pulls out goes the back to his car and gets the AK. Yeah, it's just, it's an incredible but, and, bit of police work. And yeah, and yeah, and yeah, he is actually a good guy. There's a later part where he, you know, an actual serious, like, you know, Detroit hitter gets a hold of him and is interrogating yeah. him to find out where... Yeah, that, that that guy, that guy is the kind of prick you can easily hate because he's called YOLO, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> instantly fucking, like, what's the opposite of endears you? Because it's that. Like, yeah, you know? and he, he kicks the utter shit out of Constable Bob. Yeah, and Constable he, he Bob absolutely fucking batters him, and Bob just will not give up any information, and then gets to do his knife move and fucking yeah. kill the guy. It's <laughs> and, brilliant, like, and so especially brutal. especially brilliant is as he's interrogating him, Constable Bob is like he's going, so uh, you know, give me a name, and he starts giving him like fucking Star Wars references and shit <laughs> yeah. like that because yeah. he is like this kind of lame guy, but my god, he's got heart. You you know yeah um very very good character very well the heart of gold <laughs> yeah um he's he's he genuinely and this is the thing like you know for this season for all its flaws it's got some very good standout characters in it and yeah i mean i well like plotted. i like colt as much as he's like as much as his, like fucking yeah. his antagonism as a character is like great. kind of like, fucking yeah. shit but he's, he's really fair, good like i, I was i, like, I was I like, I like the standoff in the on um, where uh they do that the decoy um and you know, Tim starts getting um, yeah. patrol flashbacks because there's like three cars around them yeah. that look like the, that he suspects are uh, IEDs. Know, IEDs. IEDs, yeah. And like he yeah. turns out to be right. And that that whole the whole standoff scene, I really really liked. And that, oh, to be yeah. fair, it's like right at the end of the season. Is it like the second to last or last episode? Yeah, it's second yeah. to last episode, and it's it's brilliant because again, like this this whole thing, like and what we got going now is a commentary on essentially how the U.S. war machine arms a lot of the conflicts that end up coming home. It's like it's it's subtle, but it's there, and it's it's mm. it's very it's very cool. Yeah, and I, but I, I mean, was, like we've, I was... we've we've talked about this season at length here, and we haven't even mentioned the fucking church, which is like just. Great. In there for the first like half the season, there's a church in town and they do shit with snakes and stuff, and it's just 
Like, yeah, the literal snake handling and the yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the the yeah, it's very it's revival just religion. Weird. Like yeah, it's weird and nothing really comes of it. Oh it's... no, uh, all on con, all contraire. Um, first of all, that shit exists and is terrifying. <laughs> I know someone who oh, has no, been I'm, to I'm, those churches. I know that, like, but I'm just saying, like, they set it up as it's like, oh, it's this big problem for Boyd, and then Boyd like fucking uh, finds out the Pays guys milking the milking snakes, and so like fucking. Uh, like gives the guy like a, an unmilked snake and the guy dies to it. And the all the whole stuff. And it's oh, yeah. like, like aside, aside from encouraging Ellen May to have a crisis of like conscience, the, the church stuff doesn't really go anywhere except for like, you know, this sort of hint that maybe like, you know, the, like Tim gets the talk to the preacher's sister a bit. But it's, it's and, also like, it's, it's not just there for its plot purpose. It serves its plot purpose, but it's there because it shows you something about Boyd and about how Boyd has changed. And like, it's, you know, Boyd, Boyd had the whole church thing. He, he was going for it. He started using church stuff cynically. Then he genuinely had a conversion and felt like he was being punished because he'd been using the church stuff cynically and wrong. Then he had a crisis of faith and realized that he didn't actually believe. And now it's come full circle for him confronting a sort of version of both of his selves. Boyd as the cynical using the church in order to get paid, which is what the sister is kind of doing. And Boyd as the sincere believer who is calling out for a God that doesn't exist which is what gets the brother killed it's about boyd and it's about showing you how boyd has changed and importantly setting up his growing villain arc for the last seasons so you know you might say plot wise it doesn't seem to do much but i, I disagree thematically wise it's necessary for a fuller understanding of who boyd is becoming and how he's changed so i think i think the reason that um that it feels a bit disjointed because it does feel a bit like all right okay well that's that whole arc kind of done and over with for the most part um is that typically these things when they come up they're either in justify for like an episode or the season long the whole season yeah yeah and that one just isn't that's kind of resolved and then boys so just kind of left I actually, in a way yeah i actually have some background knowledge on why season four is the way it is um leonard elmore was basically on his way out during the Aye. filming on this and so what they decided to do is they decided to do a homage to as much of his work as they could. So but you've got Free Ten to Yuma, which he wrote, and a whole bunch of other stuff is threaded into it. And that's mm. why it's because they were essentially giving him a good send-off, something he could enjoy, and something that would be a good legacy for him. And I do think it has hurt... I think we'd have been better picking one story and doing it well than weaving yeah. in all the different ones. But I understand why they were doing it. And it's kind of sweet in its own way. I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, like I say, it's still it's still good television. It's just oh, yeah. not as good as the rest of it. Like, um, oh yeah, we're, we're we're comparing like the heights of Mount Olympus to like you know just a a pretty nice mountain. Like, it's still good. Yeah. It's just not like as towering uh, as but seasons two I, and three. I still I still maintain that the main reason is um, because Nicky Augustine's just a prick. You hate him, but you don't love to hate him. Well, they definitely learned that lesson, and they tried to improve on it in the final two seasons. Well, uh, season absent. five, season five uh, has Michael Rappaport, and he's you just fuck. He's just a dickhead. Yeah, he's yeah. Not, like, yeah. Like Danny, Danny Crow, Danny Crow is a fucking like is a yeah. good villain. Yeah, like Danny Crow, you can actually like fucking love to hate. You know what I mean? Yeah. But mm. they, they try to they try to paint like fucking Daryl Crow Junior as like a bit too clever and above it all. He never gets his hands dirty himself, and it just. It's just not interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like this guy's big and physically imposing. And it's like that doesn't do it. it I mean, there's a good bit you. where he absolutely pests the shit out of that Nazi lad. Yeah, fair. But yeah, anyway, it's season five. Um, oh, uh, if we're moving on to season five, I'll just um, I'll just drop this from season four then. Oh right. God, you gotta be such a dick. My job being a dick. It'd be weird if you liked me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a plot thread we should probably just mention. Um, in season four, uh, it, sorry, in, in season three, actually, I think, now I come to think about it, um, there's a conspiracy up at the prison to bust. Um, yeah, when they're looking for when they're looking for Mags's money. Yeah. So when in season th uh, three, when they're trying to figure out what happened to Mags, Mags Bennett's money, Boyd gets himself put in prison with Dickie so he can question him. And a guard overhears and uh, decides with the prison doctor, who's played by Riggs from the Lethal Weapon TV show, that they're going to bust Dickie out of jail. But then in the uh, when that actually happens, um, they, they, they do it by having, like, D 
Dicky attacked in the yard so they can get him alone in the hospital. But Dewey Crow, who's in there with him, leaps to his aid and ends up being hospitalized alongside him. So they have to take both of them. And it's, and, um, it's, it's great because it's so much about, you know, you say what you like about Dewey Crow. He does stand up for his homies. And, yeah. Uh, oh, dear. So they get out and they um they have a plan to, like, like reconnect Dicky with Limehouse so we can find out where the money is. They also have this amazing prison scene about like, uh, is that where Dewey's explaining where um, like how much it hurts to get a tattoo in the neck? It's just fantastic. <laughs> it's so yeah, good. but um, yeah, they, they they bust them both out and they they like arrange for Dicky to reconnect with Limehouse, and then the um, the guard gets tracked down by Raylan, and uh, Raylan runs him over to avoid <laughs> having to shoot him yeah. twice. <laughs> yeah, twice, <laughs> <laughs> and then um. So the doctor flees with Dewey Crow and mm-hmm. uh, like fake surgery on him and tells him he's removed his <laughs> yeah. kidneys. This is and like the has proper, get, like, like the has... urban myth about people waking up in a bathtub yeah. full of ice with no kidneys. It's so good. And it's yeah, the and he only tells him he has to raise ever like believe this is Dewey fucking Crow, Dewey and Crow. it's so yeah. good. <laughs> He tells him he's got to ransom his kidneys back to him. So Dewey Crow goes on a, like a, a crime spree. Um, <laughs> One of which, the best yeah. episodes, hands yeah, down. He raises, yeah. he raises fuck all money as well on this crime spree. It's great. He, um, he, can't, he can't fucking get any money. He's terrible at like fucking at crime. And then he ends up getting <laughs> shot by a fucking... He sh- gets shot in a... Uh, he tries to rob a fucking... Co- he asks for directions in a convenience store. Gets, an, gets the knock on with the fucking like uh, <laughs> shopkeeper. Pulls a gun on him and then gets shot for blaspheming. I just want to and say like, though, every single time Dewey tries to pull out a gun, he's fucking beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's so just good. like it's also five it, seconds it, of fumbling. It's also right up there of every time Dewey tries to park a car and forgets to put the yeah, for, on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he um he ends up getting shot by the guy for blasphemy and then like hides out in the storeroom. At which point the police like surround him. Raylan turns up. And uh, he tells him, he's telling him about his kidneys and that. And Raylan says, like, well, as I understand it, your kidneys are for pissing. So why don't you try having a piss? So he stands up, you hear him pissing. And then he shouts, holy shit, you mean I had four kidneys? (laughs) 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 Which which sets us up for season five, which more or less opens with Dewey in the court. Sorry, I'm I'm telling this one. I love it so much. He's in the courtroom with his lawyer and his lawyer is saying, because of failure by the state, my client was forced at gunpoint to be, to to leave a prison and then was put through all this trauma etc and we're talking about payouts and you know it was back and forth and the judge goes okay so 600 and jury crow stands up and goes 600 dollars 600 dollars for all of this it's an outrage it's it's 300 but yeah Um, yeah and then like thousand and jury just sits down it's like everything collapses out of him what i love about that is um like prior to that scene Raylan's stressing about having to write what he's going to say on the witness stand Mm mm-hmm um, and he's really struggling to, like to write it down and everything. And then when he actually gets on the stand, he just like fucking he, he starts like sort of like fumbling his way through talking about who he is and like why do. And then he just goes, oh, you know what, fuck it, just let him go. He's an idiot. Different back in different different scene. That's yeah, when he's say, doing the witness scene. state. It's the dis- di- witness statement on Dicky Bennett, not Dewey Crow. All oh, right, right, yeah. All oh, right, well, yeah, but that that with the the Dicky Bennett one when he says like you know like and, and he just fuck, fucks it up and then Art goes like. You know, next time you tell me you're not good at something, I'm going to believe you. <laughs> <It's so good. laughs> but yeah, Dewey G- Crow gets like um, Dewey Crow gets let out with like a, a huge windfall. Buys a pool and um, <laughs> buys buys Audrey's from uh, from Boyd. Yeah, for and a then, really um, good price. He doesn't get like hosed yeah. incredibly. <laughs> He gets absolutely <laughs> ripped off, and also um, he gets left with Wade Messer, who's the uh, who appeared at the end of who was, appeared at the end of yeah. season two. He was the guy, he was one of he was one of uh, Loretta's dad's friends. Loretta mm. calls him for a ride back to Harlem when she decides she's going to go down and kill Mags, um, and then he helps like to atone for that. He helps Dicky ambush Raylan, and then um, he turns up again in season three where he's on Oxy, and there's an incredible scene where he's he's. Um, the, the guy he's stealing stuff for, uh, like, tells him he has to kill Raylan. So he arranges to re- meet Raylan at his house. Um, and then, like, you know, the plan is he'll meet him at his house. He'll get his gun from his nightstand and just shoot him. So he turns up at the house and Raylan's waiting for him. 
and he says like oh why didn't you just go inside and wait and Raylan tells him well, he goes, well I'm going to go in and change my shirt so he goes into the house and Raylan's like stood outside telling this whole folksy story about strike <laughs> yeah. breakers coming to his house when he was a kid <laughs> and how his, like, it really, his mom really imposed on him the lesson that you don't enter someone's house without permission and then like uh, Messer has to come back out without the gun and Raylan like pulls the gun out, from, out of his pocket and like and the guy's like, oh, what about all that? And he just fucking hits him. It's just... It's <laughs> <great line. laughs> Wade Messer is the only one who's maybe more of a wild incompetent than Dewey Crow. And the two of them together is like nuclear fusion. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. Would, you like a, would you like a fun fact about Wade Messer? Go on. I would. Oh, yeah. This is this is fucking incredible. This, like, <laughs> I was, I was going to say Wade Messer, who I believe is one of the bank robbers in Point Break. But David like actually pipped me on this. <laughs> Wade Messer, who was Raylan Givens in the TV film Pronto. <laughs> no fucking yeah. with, with Columbo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, like we're going to need to track that down and watch it. it. Yeah, honestly. Yeah, we are. Of, we absolutely really, are. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, definitely. But there's a, there's a really nice little bit of symmetry in this. Um, it's like not bad writing. I don't like the rest of the writing in this season, but when Raylan first meets Dewey Crow, he correctly identifies him by saying, oh, you from down Florida way? I knew some crow boys down in Florida. Because remember, he was serving as a US Marshal down in Florida in Miami. This season, because of that past connection, he has to go down to Miami to deal with a fugitive early on. And he goes talking to the crows who are down there. And he lets slip to them that Dewey yeah. has just won the payout. Which they send him down them- because the, the fugitive is one of the crows. It's... um. I can't remember his name because he's barely in the season. Is it? Yeah, he's, he's in like Dilly. Dilly. Yes, Dilly Crow. Um, I, do like how, like... I do like how all the crows start with a, with a, some variation of the letter D. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, he's he's murdered by his own elder brother and fed to crocodiles. Um, yeah, which is why being, we don't remember being, him like, much. A spectacular fuck up, like. Yeah, and and also to try and establish like Daryl Crow as like being the big villain, but it doesn't land at all in my view. No. Yeah, yeah. But they, they send they send son. Raylan down. They send Raylan down to help because he's got previous with the family, and while there, he accidentally like someone overhears him talking about like Dewey Crow and his big windfall, and so the crows all move to Kentucky. To fucking yeah, get they're in basically on that. like sort of a, a gang of vultures, as Bear probably like the best way to to, to describe yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. But like Daryl Crow Junior just isn't interesting at all. No, he's really no. not. Like he's not even. I'll be honest. He's not even. He's one. He's the one casting which I actually don't think is that well acted either. There's just something about it just comes off stilted to me in a way I can't quite describe. It might just be a bad script. So like I don't want to judge the actor too hard, but it just really doesn't land. Um, and it's a shame because. All the other, like all the other characters brought in as part of the, the cruel crime family, are really interesting, including Baptiste, who they promptly fucking murder very early on yeah. for bullshit yeah. reasons. And yeah. uh, well, that's yeah. again, though, no, that's Danny Crow. That's like Danny Crow being the more interesting of the crows. Yeah, mm-hmm. he certainly does in the most interesting way. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, like so I mean, good. you say all, all the, the crow, all the crow boys, <laughs> all the crow boys start with D's, but Kendall doesn't. But like, uh, which is a, a nice like little tell as to the yeah. fact yeah. that he's not actually one of the brothers. Um, uh, and also like the the sister who genuinely is one of the best characters in Justified. I think the way she's done, like she really uh, sold me. I, I was like, that's a very very cool and interesting portrayal. Yeah. Um, who you the thing is, out? the thing Go is, on. like we're, we're ragging on we're ragging on Michael Rappaport as Daryl Crow Junior. He's not the worst part of the season. The worst part of the season is the Ava in prison shit because. Yeah. Um, Ava gets like at the end of the previous season as part of the investigation into trying to find Drew Thompson Boyd gets in with the, the Clover Hill crowd which is where all the rich people in Harlan live Um, and then he tries to like fucking muscle them with his new connections with the Detroit mob but one of them the guy that runs the funeral home uh, like double crosses him and Ava gets uh, like caught trying to just trying to move Delroy's body mm-hmm because they they find that like they find his body the, the cops find his body and they can't like before they can get to it to move it so they have to strong arm the guy that owns the funeral home so that they can switch the body with like one they've dug up and then like they have to remove the del boy's body and chuck it in a slurry pond and for whatever fucking reason Ava in like it's doing that with Jimmy one of Boyd's henchmen and she insists 
that Jimmy gets out of the car just suddenly and for no reason other than that they need Ava and Ava alone to go to prison for this crime. She just insists that Jimmy get out of the car, like and like out of the van, and just leave it to do the job on on his on her own. Like so, then she ends up in prison, and it is just honestly the worst part of of season five. Yeah, it, yeah. It, someone got the 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 Lady Bird book of prison like movie cliches and just went through <laughs> like ticking <laughs> everything off the fucking list. It is so bad. It's also um, like it, it, it's really bad. They clearly were like, "Oh, we've got this objective for the characters. We're going to write the character towards that. Not we're going to write the character with an idea in mind and see how they develop." It's the other way around. Mm-hmm. And what they decided is that Ava had to turn against Boyd, and they do it in the most ridiculous way. Like it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't work. It just doesn't yeah, work. It like doesn't. She make ends sense. up. She ends up in prison because like that. That's badly written enough. Where it's like, "Oh, Jimmy, get out the car. You're you're like." You know, we we want you to be a main character next season. Yeah, you're you're superfluous to the plot at this point. So can you please leave yeah, for a bit? Yeah, and then in season three, she's in like the the county lockup, isn't it? And like season uh, four, Boyd's, season, uh, sorry, season five, even she's in the county lockup. Oh wait, no, sorry, yes, you're right. Season right, my bad. And um, Boyd's visiting her, and they've got like uh, the lawyer. Um, mm-hmm who is credited uh it says like the, the guy's the guy's got a name i can't remember uh there's like uh like mr geist or something isn't it but geist yeah he's actually when it like if you if you pause it on if you're watching it on amazon and you pause it and it comes up the little x-ray thing he's credited as the wild man in a lot of episodes <laughs> for some reason <laughs> um weird but like the uh like the visiting and the planet to get her out of there by, you know, Boyd like fucking goes to strong arm the the like uh, guy, the rich guy that testified that they'd stolen the body and that, but then he accidentally like beats the guy almost to death and he's in a coma and then there's some like stuff with his uh, the guy's like uh, mail, order, mail order bride, yeah, yeah. and. It's like just sort of going around in circles, and then they resolve that, and like Ava, you know, Boyd put, does everything he needs to do to get Ava out of prison. But then, oh, just as she's on the day of her release, like the one of the guards who's like this, just like weird, like fucking like, sex pest, uh, weird incel guy, stabs himself and says she did it, so she has to get transferred to like fucking federal prison, and then like at that point, it's like, oh well, you know. Uh, Boyd pays like a Nazi guy so that his sister will protect her in prison but then they like double cross him because like Boyd's a race traitor and then like she falls in with someone else who's like uh, like is it the religious woman and then but yeah they they like she fucks up the she's got to smuggle drugs into the prison and then like the, the price of that is she has to kill the the yeah, it's, it's that... so contrived. honestly this it's is like, all yeah, really bad. convoluted horseshit I can't you know and basically yeah, it's it's steering towards the last season where they basically decided they wanted Ada to be an informant caught between Raylan and Boyd and they wanted Boyd to be the villain of the last season. I hate all of this. I really do. I, I, well, I genuinely... Well, you're wrong because season six is <laughs> one of the best seasons. Uh, um, yes, needed. But, like, I mean, even in the middle of season five there when she's in prison, Boyd's trying to find the, the guard and she just, like, she breaks up with Boyd and tells him not to come back. And yeah, you're like, for no reason. Yeah, Why? And then Boyd finds the fucking incel guy and captures him and then like is about to torture him and the guy starts crying and says he loves her and Boyd just lets him go and it's like Yeah, again. What the fuck is that about? Like, do you know what I mean? It's five five is definitely the worst season, like. Um Is it season Oh, I think it's season six actually, where um Win Duffy turns up with the cattle prod. Yeah, it's six. Yeah, which six. to be which to be fair, the payoff for that, eh, it's pretty uh, quite enjoyable that. <laughs> Yeah. Um But yeah, it, en- it ends with like uh the crows like fucking Danny Crow is constantly referencing like the twenty one foot rule, which if anyone's not familiar, it's some <laughs> fucking bullshit, some like hard man made up on the internet where it is definitely uh, some it, Reddit shit. Like one hundred it's, it's, yeah, it's, guys, oh it's even better than that. The police made it up. US go police made it up. Watch, shoot people. Go away and watch surviving edged weapons, do it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, the, it's, the it's idea taking... is the idea is if if uh, in if someone has a gun and someone else has a knife, 
and they're 21 feet apart, the man with the knife has ample time to run up and stab the person with the gun before they can draw and shoot. And he's just obsessed with like trying this like over and over. And then he eventually gets to like try it try it with Raylan. And um <laughs> Raylan so clears Raylan clears his holster, but doesn't like have to shoot him because he trips into a grave he was digging for his own dog, stabs himself through the throat. <laughs> yeah, I mean the so thing about shit. that scene though is that Raylan is clearly taken by surprise because he actually draws his gun, like almost fumbles it. Yeah. And, yeah, because he's and, like, and nobody's also, this fucking stupid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he, he straight up says, uh, to, you know, in my defense, I would have warned you, but I didn't see it either. <laughs> it's just yeah. so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, he, try, he, he keeps trying to fucking, like, uh, get people, like, get bait people into doing that. He, he almost does it with Eric Roberts, who is in it as one of the worst characters in the yeah. show. Yeah, let's not yeah. talk about that. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Although the Eric Roberts ep- episode does bring us the showdown with uh, Roscoe and Jay, who are like just incredible, in once again with like the henchmen are fucking better than the the villains. Because <laughs> at one point in this, in one point in that season, uh, like Johnny Crowder is like the antagonist, mm-hmm. um, and he's like he's bribed Hot Rods. He's he, like he's working for Hot Rod, but then he's bribed Hot Rods guys to turn on Hot Rod. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he ends up getting like shot in Mexico for his trouble. But the mm-hmm. like, um, Roscoe and Jay, as like two of his two of Hot Rod's henchmen, are just great. Just, I mean, Wood Harris, like, do you know what I mean? Like, we were saying when we in the aborted episode on Dread, Wood <laughs> Harris is a really good actor. Um, no lies, he's really good. I mean, he's he's incredible in The Wire as well, but yeah, um. It's it's him and uh, I think I think they're brothers actually. Uh, the other guy is yeah they are yeah the other guy is is it Steve Harris and he's um, I want to say he's the fucking sergeant guy that gets shot in the neck in the rock. Oh, that's a deep cut. Um, but yeah, like they they're a couple of. Shakespeare quoting like henchmen yeah. and they're they're great like uh <laughs> Braylon has a run in run in with them earlier in this in the season when he has to um he has to help or he gets manipulated by Loretta into helping her uh like deal with them mm-hmm. because Loretta and her boyfriend bought uh bought drugs from Hot Rod and then like just didn't like it just ran off with the money or something like that and then they buried the money but then she moved it without telling the boyfriend and <laughs> uh, they they take the boyfriend and they're like he's trying to dig up the money and they're going to kill him and Raylan turns up and hits them with a shovel <laughs> and then has to like has to talk down hot rod you know what i mean like it, there's I, i'll take my like I'll, I'll kill four of you before i like uh before you clear your holsters and then i'll take my chances with the other two <laughs> and then he realizes he realizes afterwards that like Loretta basically manipulated him because she got out of a depth in the drug trade and then like you know what I mean like abused his kindness and then he says like um he, t- he tells her like you know like Jesus Loretta please take it easy on the rest of us <laughs> which sets her up to for a return in season 6 um and how yeah it also we also introduce um Mary Steenburgen as Catherine Hale in that season yep and also Nikki no Robertson i think gets... she's she makes an, an earlier appearance i'm sure that's what i said i'm um, sorry i meant in five yeah and yeah no, she no gets earlier season. than that even i'm sure she's i'm sure she shows up with Wendy duffy oh, at one I point don't... earlier than that read about the, oh, so. the touring stuff i'm almost certain she does well yeah that's that's in five is that five you sure yeah because um uh duffy she... is like trying to import heroin with boyd yeah, and they they make a deal with they get the Canadians to introduce them to like the Mexican pipeline or something, don't they? Yeah, uh, and, and then also they fuck that up. Yeah, and also very importantly, she's in the room when Nikki Augustine uh, gets gets. I believe it's Nikki Augustine gets dealt no, with. No, it's boy. not. It's Picker. Oh, it's Picker. Sorry, yeah. my bad. Yeah, with the oh, red yeah. IED. <laughs> yeah, 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 so that's good. That's fucking. That's fucking... 
that whole scene is still I just watch that on YouTube sometimes just as a pure enjoyment. Yeah. I just it's, love it's... Win Duffy's reaction to that whole thing. Like, oh, just, like his his honestly, Win Duffy's reactions to everything are fucking incredible. Yeah. Yes. Like yeah. uh, early I just want to like go off on about it, but one bit I'd really like is when um I just, I think it's see I think I can't remember if it's season three or four where Raylan's just like had enough of his shit. Oh, and, it's uh, the, starts... the Russian roulette in season yeah. three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Jesus and, uh, Christ! <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, like it's with, great because like... he goes from he goes from oh, what are you doing? Are you go, are you going to play a little Russian roulette with me there and all that? And then like when he actually pulls the trigger, he just fucking like sh- like flips his shit. It's great. <laughs> Which to be it's fair, also, you would. Yeah, it's also the way he put, the way he puts pronunciation. It's not Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ! Like he really. Yeah, it's none of us know, can do this justice. Like. No, it's, it's yeah. so good. What the hell is wrong with you? And uh, <laughs> it's so good. It's really excellent. Yeah, I yeah, mean, like, um, honestly, if 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 we were like bad, you know, Reddit people, we would like just make thre- threads of like when Duffy reacts to things. But you know, we're yeah. better than that. We have a podcast. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah. yeah. It's excusable yeah. when a man has such expressive eyebrows. He does. He does. <laughs> He does. <laughs> They're fucking incredible. There's a majestic eyebrows. Yeah. But yeah, Mary Steenberg turns up as the um the wife of like a former crime lord who was killed. The the assistant district attorney we mentioned earlier is um uh David Vasquez. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's in all five all five seasons, but one of his like earliest and, and cases is in uh, Band of Brothers as well. Yeah. Small one work. of his um one of his earliest cases involves uh Grady Hale who's like a fucking crime lord in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um and he got like he got ratted out by someone and then uh killed in prison and Vasquez's boss got killed like just shotgunned in the street in broad daylight so that no one and he was the only person who ever knew the identity of the the guy that flipped on Hale. Um, and then that comes back in season six. Mm. Um, yes. And Before I don't we... think. There you go. I was just going to say, I don't think there's anything else from season five worth talking about, really, is there? <laughs> no, not really. It's the weakest season. <laughs> you fools. Is there any way to put a reply on TC's blog? <laughs> God, no. <laughs> Technology to reply to a post is decades away. <laughs> <laughs> So the yeah, IT guy for the marshals is yeah. one of the best. It just he's he's close to our hearts. Yeah, <laughs> he turns up in season one, I think, with the guy, the the guy from Walking Dead, who's like got out of jail and gone straight back to Robin Banks. Season two, is that two? Is it? I think it's season two. Is one of the banknotes? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. that that whole fucking episode in season five is fucking great, though. I love that episode. Just yeah, the so IT guy. The IT guy turns up in an earlier season, um, and someone asks him, "Like, uh, can we can we get a look at what's on? Like, can we see what's on the guy's computer?" And he just responds, "What am I, an asshole?" <laughs> and then um, he, there's an episode where someone, like the, the Geordie from Castle, in fact, walks into the office <laughs> demanding to know what happened to the money they seized, and it turns out like the uh, the gambling website that like Ridge Winnings were seized from, the sign saying the marshals have like take like they've seized it and taken all the assets spelled marshall wrong um <laughs> and so he go he he walks out and he gets like he hires a goon and they go to like strong arm the programmer that set up the website and Raylan like uh also tracks down the guy that like founded the website and the, the guy like escapes the guy despite having only one leg escapes Raylan by jumping out of a window and then updates the website to have like a fucking message on about how he like he owned a US marshal <laughs> and then Raylan asks the IT guy if it's possible to put a response on and then we get that like incredible line <laughs> um, and then there's a great bit later on where like Tim tries to fist bump him and he just asks if he can leave <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he is every inch the fucking IT guy it's beautiful it's so good oh <laughs> uh. But yes. then we come to season six. Yeah, which is a great season. Honestly, yeah, it's fantastic. It's it's on par with season two. I would I would say. I I really like season six. Like yeah, 
I think, right, okay, here's what will get me shouted at. I think season six has a solid core plot um, that's at the center of it. Unfortunately, it's ruined by just too much fan service. Mm. Res- as a fan, I respectfully disagree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your honor, the prosecution rests. <laughs> yeah, it's like, do you know what I mean? It, it's the perfect ending to the show. It like tie, it, 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 yeah, it ties back into like all five previous seasons. It does it really well, and it's like just, it's a it's a great final season, and it it, it is, it has like aside from the Bennets, it has the best villains I think, in the it, whole show. So here's the thing: it's got good villains and the central plot around like weed legalization, etc. It's all great. It's like genuinely excellent. My problem is they kind of butcher character. It's like the same problem with Ava in the season before. They butcher characterization to write towards a particular end, and I just think it fails because of that. And like for example, the, the thing that really gets me is they just basically rewrite the character of AUSA Vasquez, um, so they can set up the drama in the final episodes with oh he thinks real and is in on etc. It's, it's horseshit. Doesn't fit at all. Nothing like the level-headed guy who's previously been in it. But they uh, they need to ratchet up attention. No, so I think that's um, I think I think all of that from Vasquez is entirely justified. Like, I'm I if don't... you'll pardon the fucking like pun, but. I... Because well, I, mean, I love no, it when they say like, the no, name of the TV show. Yeah. TV show. <laughs> it would be right. Here's the thing: the the position he states makes sense, except it doesn't make sense for his character. If it was a different, you know, AUSA that was saying it, you could buy it. But unfortunately, this is Vasquez, who's been involved in the previous, who's seen it all through, and who's honestly like he's smarter than us. He's, he's characterized differently. It doesn't fit the character. Similarly. Um, a lot of what they have um, in terms of like driving the characters towards an end, it's, 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 it's the same problem with Ava. They've decided how they want to end the show. And I'll give them credit. The the ending and the, like you know if you will, time skip after, it's all great. Love it. It genuinely is actually really well put together. I do like Boone. I think Boone is well done. Very well yeah. well, well put together. Yeah. Um, but it, it's what they, what they have to drive at in order to make it happen. And I mean, it, it's just, I, I just don't think it hangs together. To in the way point, that it should. Really. To put your point with Vasquez, actually, it makes perfect thematic sense um, mm-hmm. because part of that whole season is about how old shit that's just been left and not fucking addressed needs to be addressed, and when it's not addressed, people get fucking weird about it. I yeah, really I mean, it is a t- it's a TV show about essentially about you can't really escape your past you have to face it in some way or another and that is the that is this season is just that yeah. writ large is it not yeah yeah like, the, i mean it, it pushes characters to do things that even like, is slightly over the line for them like Raylan full on leaves his fucking badge and shit to just go away and go full on vigilante at one point just to find boyd yeah, yeah and this is part the, of the, problem, uh, the thing like... with the thing with the thing with Ava as well is like I I agree that like the fucking the whole Ava in prison stuff is is shit as I said but from the like from the position she's in at the start of this season like I think she's do you know what I mean the character is yeah. like perfectly fucking like fine from that point on you yeah. know it's like it's it's entirely fucking like believable yeah. but um and she's playing both sides so that she always comes out on top so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> But no, I mean it's it's uh, it's an absolutely like just fantastic season. I think like um, Sam Elliott himself is a prick, but like he is pretty good in this. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they basically decided they wanted the season to end with Boyd basically begging to be shot by Raylan and Raylan not shooting him. Like that, that's the, that's the, that's the like absolute like a poggy of the entire thing, and they wrote towards it and. It's a great idea. I don't think it was as competently executed as stuff like season two. And well, it's, it's I mean, a shame. I don't know. I mean, the like the question. Like, I mean, even though I've seen it before, I'm sort of asking myself: Would will he do this? Maybe. And then you know, it's yeah. uh, like it's genuinely like who is who is Raylan Givens, and that is a question that is always being asked, and it is asked again in that scene, and we get an answer. So yeah. I think that's I think it's satisfying in that regard. It is, but as I said, like I mean, that's not... the thing with like the the previous two seasons, they they like they end with Raylan like watching someone else like kill the fucking person he wants dead, um, which is just like 
piss weak, quite frankly. You know what I mean? If you go, oh, like, Raylan, like, learns that he doesn't have to shoot everyone himself, it's like, well, what's the, he's a fucking gunslinger, that's what he does. Like, where well, he lets, lets Nicky Augustine get machine gunned by the mob, and then he watches, like, fucking uh, Daryl Crow Jr. bleed to death after someone else shoots him. It just feels like, you know, he stands over him and gloats as he's bleeding to death, and it just doesn't feel like Raylan, you know? Raylan solves his own problems. Well, it's and also... then by the end of season six... He, like you know it's like yeah he has every reason in the world no one would complain if he shot Boyd but like he doesn't because he's he's finally grown as a person yeah well it, that, feels, that, it feels more earned than in the previous seasons like I like I said I, I like the ending and I like what they ended up with and especially like it, it works so the thing is in the previous seasons the question is not is real and justified in shooting people the question is is real and justified in his anger and like his, you know, his attachment to it, to which ultimately the answer is no, and he learns that, and he's able to prove it with Boyd. But with, uh, you know, he he straight up the gloating over the guy's death is still he's playing out his anger. It's just using someone else as the the vector for it, etc. So it's like I can see what they're going for there. Piss poor written though, um, and it's partly because the the villain there wasn't very good. In the final season, I like what they got, and like I said, the. Uh, Everything up to, including just this little, lovely little touch, uh, post-time skip at the end, Raylan's in another office, and he's got, he's wearing a patterned t-shirt, like a brand t-shirt. He would never do that previously. Um, but here it is, it's showing you that he's kind of unwound a bit. And like you know, Miami. Yeah, well, but it's, previously when he was in Miami, he's wearing a shirt all the time, and here he is, he's wearing a, a patterned t-shirt, which is just, you know, his character has changed, he's grown, he's not as uptight as he used to be, and you know he's made it. Um... And it's like it's it's quite good, but I, and similarly, like the other thing that makes me, me kind of sad is like again, main plot and the characters, the villains, all really well done and hangs together well. The stuff with Loretta, um, you know, the ensemble bringing back the the previous like plot threads and bringing them in, quite good. It's just that it's, it's just honestly the Ava Boyd stuff. I uh, just really that and the the unnecessary tension to make uh, Raylan on the outside and surrender is kind of gun at the end. I just, I don't think it was well written. And it's, I'll be totally honest with you. I am curious to see how the sequel series they're doing, um, City Primeval, will work. The thing that's got me worried is that it's set in Detroit and I'm really worried we're just going to get just random asshole dipshits like Nicky Augustine um, rather than actual strong characters like we've had through the Justified series. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel it. like it, going from Kentucky, a place that is very poor, working class, industry the only, there's only one industry and that industry isn't as big as it used to be going from there to detroit is not a huge leap i mean no. yeah there's a there's a lot that could make it work as long I as just... nobody drinks coffee because it's too middle class you know <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely you they can drink coffee, drink coffee it's just not allowed to have coffee. a froth on it yeah <laughs> it's like i don't know it could work i just i just hope that they're better with their villains and i hope they, they take their time with their plotting for it honestly and don't try and rush towards a specific like you know, let it breathe a little bit and and try and find I mean, ways to. They've got insane pedigree, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, season six, season six is incredible. Um, the it, and the plot is basically like the plot of like most westerns. You know, someone's someone wants to buy up all the land for business purposes, and so they're mm-hmm. strong arming like uh, all of the fucking locals into selling. It's it's like landlords bad. Um. But it's great. There's like so. There's a there's a bunch of private military dipshits like so going good. around town, um, like trying to fucking force people to sell their houses to them, and uh, and they're just they they're incredible villains because like the three of them are just like fucking genuinely like a, a, a joy to detest. Yeah, and including uh, what was it? Uh, Loco locomotive. What's he called? Choo choo. Choo choo. That's Choo-choo. it. Choo-choo. Like yeah, he's great. Choo Choo, Sea Bass, and um, Walker. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just the names alone. What a pleasure! And I mean that that stuff there, like the the military stuff there with Tim, works much. It seems much more natural than like the mm. stuff yeah. in season four. Yeah, um, there's the whole bit where fucking Choo Choo takes them to the the pizza yeah, place where they're all hanging out. Off, <laughs> yeah, picks them up. And he's and just picks them up and, and he's, he's just, just walking around the casing the joint and like. It's great, like <laughs> <laughs> just totally like <laughs> proper fucking uh, yeah. I also served type shit, and like they're obviously some of them are fucking like sea bass is just not fucking having it at all. He wants them gone. Choo choo, yeah. like, oh, he's one of us though, so it's fine. Um, and then <laughs> he shows the fucking badge. She's like, right, okay, 
Catch you later. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell, also... the cow- I'll tell the cowboy what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also great because the characterization, like, you know, Choo Choo is the way he is because he, like, got hit with an IED and it, like, da- gave him brain damage. Um, yeah. And, like, you know, the way they kind of, they do a really good job of, again, giving you a villain. Who's a villain? But they, like, humanize him and give him good characterization. Mm. So, like, all of this stuff I love. I think it's really, really good. And don't get me wrong, like, ranking the seasons, um, I don't think it's the worst. I honestly think season five's the worst. Um, but, I don't know. And then there's, the, then there's the main villains, who are a hell of a duo, and reach in real deep into their Western pedigree for the, <laughs> for the, <laughs> the final man. God damn. Sam Elliott. Bless him. Absolutely fantastic. Don't bless him, he's a knob. Is he? <laughs> He's yeah, good in he's, this, like. He's good. He's yeah, he's good prick. in this, but he is a prick. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. I genuinely don't know anything yeah. about his personal life. He okay. he he, were, he was saying about how um, women didn't know how to play real cowboys, and it's like, motherfucker, you're an actor as well. Like, what are you talking Fuck about? Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was it was um it was women and gay people. Oh, fuck couldn't, of couldn't, do, couldn't do cowboy <laughs> stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. like you do not uh, want to sort of, too. He, he's on that fucking Chris Pratt vibe, I think. Oh, fuck mm. them. It's always a shame. It's like, uh, do you want me to ruin? Do you know Art? He's an absolute dipshit in real life. Oh, you well. fucking Rush Limbaugh yeah. fan. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. Um. So, like, fucking Sam Elliott's Avery Markham, who is mm. like the uh, former partner of like deceased crime lord Grady Hale. Um. And it turned out he was sleeping with Catherine Hale, Grady's mm. wife. And then after, like. Grady got ratted to the feds. Markham fled, but like Catherine's unsure as to whether he fled because he was the one that ratted him or whether he thought he would be next. And um, so she's planning, she assumes he was the one that had Grady killed in prison. And so she's planning to rob him with Wynn Duffy and Boyd. Mm-hmm. Um, But they can't, like when they, when they break into his safe deposit box, they find like a bunch of land deeds and stuff and so then they start working out that he's like planning to buy up like all the farmland so that he can grow legal weed if it becomes legalized in Kentucky um which was not in uh, just for record at the time this was being filmed that was not an impossible plot line like that that was conceivable and foreseeable so yeah well I mean more Um, and more states are sort of getting legalized still not an impossible plot line yeah, exactly. And like Kentucky's like to... been known for years and years to like have a massive weed industry, legal or otherwise. Like, yeah, but yeah. the problem is the Republicans in Kentucky are insane. But a whole other story, anyway. But yeah, so they he's sending around um he's sending around these private military guys to like strong arm people into selling up, and if people won't sell up, they're like killing them if they if that means the house would then like be auctioned by the county. Mm. And um, he tries to buy. He tries to buy, like, Raylan's dad's house from him. Mm-hmm. He just turns up with, a, like, a briefcase full of money, which obviously, like, just, <laughs> you know what I mean, puts him, like, dead in Raylan's fucking, like, crosshairs. Oh, do we do we say that uh, Arlo's dead as well? Oh, yeah, he gets oh, killed in... Mm-hmm. He gets killed in season four. Oh, season four's just not yeah, very good, so four, we, yeah. we just kind of skimmed over that. Yeah, because, like, he knows who the fucking... He knows who Drew Thompson him, is. Him so. and uh, the the sheriff or whatever from season one. Who we didn't mention the, either. Yeah. Yeah. yeah are the only mind, two people who on. know who Drew Thompson is and uh, the, the sheriff who's also in prison now kills Arlo. Yeah. Um, another thing while we're, while we're briefly back at season four as well. Did not like how season four just like took the Nobles Hollow stuff and just fucking like yeeted it. Yeah. Limehouse who was like in season three, Limehouse is like like the fucking um, ultimate man of his word. He won't like you know Mags Bennett's dead, and he still won't like break his promise to her, and all this sort of stuff. And what is established to be like a fairly important like part of the fucking like setting is there's only one way in and out of Noble's Holler, and they protect it. They have a guard on it at all times because like fucking you know rednecks might come up and try and kill them. And then in season four. It's just oh we'll just go we'll go up the back road into Nobles Holler suddenly because they're gonna go and like get in there and also Limehouse is just a fucking like dipshit in that season. Um, he's like you know they make someone yeah. makes a deal with him and then he just decides at the last minute he's changing the deal and like all this sort it's just fucking bollocks like. 
But... Yeah, it's. It, I'll be totally honest with you. The inconsistent writing in Limehouse in season four is really forgettable. I'm not very. I'm not very fond of that either. Yeah. This is pod consensus. But, mm. um, but yeah, season six, like, um, the fucking the the private military guys like fuck everything up, don't they? It's like, oh, they just make it, a complete hash out of everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're working with a local uh, real estate guy. And then they have to like interrogate him to find out because he was the only other person that knew which Boyd starts buying up the properties they're after. Mm-hmm. And they, they figure the real estate guy has to be the source of the leak because he hasn't told them that Boyd robbed his um, safe deposit box. He got the stuff back, but uh, like he didn't tell them. And they go like Seabass and Choo Choo go to an interrogate him. And Seabass tells Choo Choo to give him a starter tap and he just kills him with one punch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Like the Jim Jones cult. Yeah. I, I will I will say like one of my favorite things about this this show in general is what I I is what's quite rare I think in sort of crime Western ish TV is like a lot of the time like criminals are portrayed as like masterminds with complicated plans yeah. and stuff. It's like no, most of the time they are like great fucking dipshits and it's like this show does a great line and not just like writing very good dipshits but then just show like no most of these people are just fucking tools and that's like a really nice way to just like think about this stuff yeah, yeah it's it, it's it's not afraid to show you that pretty much everyone involved is deeply flawed and uh you know the only way no, no, the not, cops not, are not, able not to... Not deeply flawed. Like, I don't want to get back into the Shakespearean thing. I mean, that is in there, but it's just like... No, they're just... Like, most low-level criminals, and most criminals are low-level criminals, are just dipshits, and they're just kind of just... Yeah, you know, with Choo Choo just, like, killing the guy with one punch, it's like, no, you were just, you know, you were only supposed to, like, tap him lightly so we could ask him some questions. Yeah. yeah. But this is this is a thing. It's like it shows you the only way the cops um, get away with like solving the crimes they do is because they're committed by dipshits and impulsive people and like poor impulsive people, um, you know, who are impulsive because of environmental factors. It's like it all kind of ties together, and then it contrasts that with the people who actually are villains, who are for the most part just n- not even necessarily particularly smart, but just like more organized and have slightly better impulse control. And it's, yeah. it's really, it I works well. I do like well. the bit where Robert Qualls says, and that's why it's called Organised Crime. Organised Crime, crime. yeah. 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 <laughs> There's the bit with the Canadians in uh, season five as well, where like uh, Will Sasso's like, the thing about organised crime is it's supposed to be organised. <laughs> when they're talking about like the Detroit guy, uh, Sammy Tornan's like killing people with chainsaws and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> another, another feel, son. Yeah. Yes. Ah, oh, Sammy Tonin's a great Phil son, though. It's He's fucking well fantastic. Done. Like half the reason yeah. that Robert Quarles is so fucked up is because Sammy Tonin's such a Phil son that still gets fucking like <laughs> jobs and import. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. So the the private military guys like they they have to get rid of they they fuck up getting rid of the the realtor's body because it gets discovered and he has Raylan's business card on him. Um, <laughs> it's so funny when uh, what's the fucking line? Um, I w- was it more? I wish more people would get murdered had a marshal's card on them or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, is that I can't remember. Is it is is this still the season where um, uh, Raylan can't can't pronounce realtor and he keeps saying realtor? Oh, that's like season one, I think. When he's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually Winona's asks. Husband. Is yeah, it realtor or realtor? Gary... <laughs> Yeah, um, they fuck up getting rid of his body, and they also like he had a um, he had a girl with him, and they have to send like Choo Choo to to kill her. But like Choo Choo has an attack of conscience because the girl's nice to him, and so he rings up and he's like clearly fucking not gonna do it. So Walker goes out to fucking uh, Walker goes out to like kill Choo Choo and do the job himself but gets followed by the marshals because he's like fucking useless <laughs> and ends up getting like shot in the the like they get, ends up getting shot in the crossfire and then um he he goes to ground and Raylan like tells Markham he should put out you know like oh you solve your problem if you put out a reward so you get like a hundred thousand dollar reward for any like information that leads to his capture because like he's hiding out with Boyd 
and then Boyd like immediately fucking like turns him in for the reward. And there's a great bit where he's like running out the back of Ava's house, and Raylan goes out and he's like sh- shoots at Raylan, and Raylan shoots him, and and when he goes over, he's like, "Oh, you shot me in the back." And he's like, "Well, if you wanted to get shot in the front, you should have run towards me." <laughs> <laughs> And then he goes, he, he takes Boyd to collect the reward. And when fucking uh, Markham opens the door and sees Boyd there, because they've, they've already had like a, a run in, he sees Boyd there and he goes, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And <laughs> Raylan says, it's not important who's getting the reward. And Markham just says, it is not unimportant. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, Seabass, like despairing at the fact that he had to like let his other two fucking like mates from the army die tries to fucking betray uh Markham gets shot in the, the gets shot in the fucking head by Catherine Hale mm-hmm. uh, as a result of that and then um and then Markham like sends for a good old boy uh, who is just a fucking incredible character like oh he's uh, so good he's so I mean, fucking creepy it's unreal yeah. oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's excellent it's fucking amazing. You're it's basically... introduced. You introduce this character with him basically having shot the head off of a snake, and leaving yeah. it in Loretta McCready's house, and then saying, "Boy, whoever shot that off that uh, that head off that snake sure is a good shot." Yeah, <laughs> it's it's great because what we did to develop him is we sat down and he went point by point. What are Raylan's great strengths and great weaknesses and let's just do the inverse of all of them well, yeah it's Raylan's Wario yeah. it's so good <laughs> it's so good Raylan has good natural charisma this guy is creepy as fuck um, Raylan's uh, you know a quick draw and is very good with it well this guy's a quick draw but he's too cocky and he doesn't yeah. take the easy shot which is and more he has relevant like a fucking, he has like a, a, a pre-civil war gun as well for some yeah. fucking reason it's like <laughs> you know. which he's named calls it Jenny R- Raylan doesn't care about like appearance of things and the myth of it. He just cares about kind of you know um, get, getting the job done. This guy, this guy cares about the myth of yeah. the thing. Like Ray- it, Raylan is wearing the hat because he tried it on once and it fit. This guy is wearing the hat because he saw Raylan wear the hat and he thought, oh, I need a hat too because that's part of the myth of the thing. And so he goes and gets a hat. Oh, little reference: the hat the villain wears is actually the hat that Raylan is described as wearing in the stories. So that's oh, why... Also, they... There's also the bit where Raylan says to Boone, uh, like, have you ever seen a cowboy movie? And he's like, oh, no. He says, like, yeah, did you get that gun off John Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, like, I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. And he starts, like, old movie cowboy. It's also... Um, this guy's young and like that's yeah. you know billy the kid and he has like he in. has he has what can only be described like as a pedo tash yep i mean yeah he's like very very fucking like we say creepy like he is basically he's non coded he is calling yeah. he's calling loretta mccready his girlfriend well yeah. this is the thing like, at one point he says to someone she's 16 though so legal <laughs> it's also <laughs> like, like yeah. They straight up said, like, what's one of Raylan's characteristics in the show? Raylan's, like, Loretta's protector. Therefore, this guy has to be another predator for Loretta for it to work in symmetry. And it's just, it's, it's really well done. They very... Uh, what I really love about it is they took all the opposites of Raylan, but managed to combine them in a believable foil, which feels like good old boy Reddit. Kind of, it's the only way I can kind of describe him a little bit. It's very, it's very, very, very well done. And yeah, he's, um... He's just fucking like an incredible villain. I mean, of all the fucking of all the like people you love to hate in the show, like he's the easiest yes, to fucking yes. like. Do you know what I mean? Like, really, you really, really want to see him get his fucking comeuppance. It's just incredible. And, and um, shout out to the actor because he, he nails it from the very first, his, from his very first scene to his very last scene. Every scene he's in, he downright nearly steal, steals the scene. He's that good. So yeah, we get a uh, we get a great scene in the middle of this season where. Um, Markham's hosting a party at the mm-hmm. the pizza restaurant he uses as a base because it has like a fucking like un old timey it safe. literally an old timey vault. Yeah. yeah, it used to be a bank and then they converted it and he's like, well, that's where I can store my money that I can't put in the federal bank because it's you know really yeah. to legal weed. So he's having a he's having a party in the pizza place for all the townsfolk so that he can try and like you know ingratiate himself and um, Loretta like basically does the exact same fucking mm-hmm. thing mags bennett does in the church when the, mm-hmm. the woman from the mining company's like trying to ingratiate herself with the townsfolk and she gives the same sort of speech about how like you know she'll buy their land and she'll like give them the jobs and keep hauling for harm people and all this sort of stuff and uh 
It's really good. And then, like, at some point as well, we should address what is, honestly for me, the greatest scene in the whole show. All right. Which is um, when, like, fucking... Because it's revealed that Win Duffy was the rat that, like, fucking uh, got Grady Hale, mm-hmm. like, flipped. And may possibly have been the guy that shotgunned Simon Poole, the mm-hmm. district attorney in the street. Um, but his bodyguard catches wind of this. Or he, ha- he has to rat for the marshals, like, in the current... In the present day. And his bodyguard's not happy about it. Because um, he's, he's like a fucking... Code. <laughs> yeah, he's got a code. His bodyguard yeah, is a himbo called Mikey. Mikey is a literally cauliflower eared as well. It's fucking yeah. great. Yeah. Um and like he fucking he figures out that like uh Duffy must have ratted on Hale back in the day and then like takes Duffy prisoner and calls Catherine Hale to come and fucking like get a revenge. Um Markham offers to do it for her, but she like goes to do it herself. And then there is a fucking incredible scene in the Winnebago uh, when Duffy's handcuffed to the table and, like, Catherine Hale is, like, getting ready to shoot him. And when Duffy convinces Mikey to intervene without actually addressing Mikey directly, it's it's a fucking absolute masterclass of a scene. It's also um, Catherine, Catherine Hale does it unintentionally as well because they're well, both that's, yeah, talking about... Like, yeah, because Duffy manipulates her into, like, into fucking like basically triggering like Mikey's sense of honor. Yeah, you <laughs> don't betray your partner. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. So like Mikey steps in front, like says, you know, what if we just let him go and let him fend for himself? Because he's my boss and I would have to avenge him. And so she shoots Mikey, and then you get like what is the most brutal fucking scene I think I've ever seen on TV. Mm. Mm. Um it's just absolutely fucking like. I mean, Mikey takes what, like four or five shots. No, the, to... f- the full six. The gun's empty by the end, like. Yeah, like yeah. You get but... shot six times and then like fuck, but still manages to kill her. Yeah, but he he ends up strangling her on the table that Duffy is handcuffed to, and Duffy yeah. is like slid under the table, and like the lich- like the blood is just dripping down around him. Yeah, yeah it's a very very fucking brutal scene. And is, uh, like... he's comforting Mikey as Mikey's like, I'm cold, hold me, as he's dying. <laughs> and you're like, it's fucking when Duffy sells it, his reactions yeah. throughout the entire scene sell the sheer horror of it. Um, yeah. it's, I, I will say, like, it's not my favourite scene, but I do think it's up there as one of the best acted scenes, hands down. Well, you'll never you'll never fucking listen to, like, Packard Bell's canon in D the same way again. No, you? <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very good. It's 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 so good. Like it's g- genuinely they do an awful lot with that. And what's really great, um, I've got another little detail for you, by the way. Um, so the guy playing Win Duffy, uh, you know how he talks about Fiji and various other things at various points. <laughs> In real life, he was going on holiday to Fiji, and they'd planned for him to take a GoPro with him and film himself like surfing in Fiji, so they could then clip that in as an after credits little sting of like this is what Win Duffy's doing with his life after you know Justified. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, the the GoPro they gave him like broke off and fell to the bottom of the ocean, so he couldn't do it. Um, but yeah, that scene was meant to be when Win Duffy decides to get out of crime, believe it or not. Yeah, but it's so. great though because like like I say, he manipulates like. Uh, he manipulates Hale into like fucking like fucking up her assassination, and then like afterwards when like you know Mikey says like will you hold me and he's like sitting like holding him, and um and you see him clock the fucking tennis bracelet and ring mm-hmm. on like Hale's dead body, which he then like steals before the police arrive, yeah, and used to fund his like uh, his getaway. But it's also quite quite good the the line delivery when he calls nine one one after Mikey dies, and uh, they say what's your emergency and he's like I honestly don't know where to begin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's uh it's it's really good and I've got to say, apart from Raylan Givens, that's the one character I would really like to return for City Primeval. Um, I mean, he's probably one of the best positioned to do so. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah he's got a so. fucking Detroit connection and everything. Yeah. 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 Um, don't think he will though. Um, I've, no, I've, maybe not. I don't know how. I don't know if anyone wants to stay like completely fucking pure of anything to do about this. But I've had a little look into what the next season series is going to be. <clears throat> um, so we know it's set in Detroit. It is based on another Elmore yeah. Leonard novel. Yeah, it is. So that 
at least you know they're writing from the same type of stuff at least um and it doesn't look as if there's going to be much in the way of returning cast at all um short of railing no oh, well, well that's the, fair the, enough i suppose the story they're writing from doesn't even feature railing they've just rewritten it because we're like hang on we have this we could use this so yeah mm-hmm. But either way, like I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's been really interesting to hear. Um, in filming, they had to stop filming one day because uh, twice. fucking twi- two sorry, different yeah. on two different occasions, a fucking gunfight like interrupted their filming. Um, the <laughs> first occasion was a pair of cars drove through the set while shooting at each other, which is just holy shit. Uh, Detroit man. <laughs> I watched them. Yeah, um, I watched not, an interview with him. Not a frothy coffee in sight. <laughs> <laughs> and like at the time, he was like. You know, fucking in his normal gear with the fucking gun on his hip and everything. <laughs> he was just kind of like, uh... <laughs> just a fucked up position to be in. Yeah. But yeah. So the the end of season six, um, like obviously, like everyone's crimes go wrong, and uh, Ava shoots Boyd. But then, like fucking, <laughs> thus doing the the rare twofer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Ava shoots Boyd and tries to like because Boyd fucking um, kidnaps Catherine Hale and steals all of Markham's money after he fails to get into the fucking bank vault. He has this whole mm-hmm. plan where he's gonna like extend a mine shaft to underneath the fucking restaurant and like get into the mine, uh, get into the vault from below. But um, it like goes wrong because he's relying on Ava's uncle, who is not a fan of the fucking Crowder clan because of the mm-hmm. way his brother treated Ava. Um, who's it, it, that's the lawnmower man, isn't it? That plays Zachariah. I think it is. Yeah, he uh, like he tries to kill Boyd in the mine and then disappears. And uh, Raylan's waiting in the fucking pizza portal with Markham, watching the vault, waiting for Boyd to like fucking break through the floor. And then um, they hear like a big explosion, but nothing happens. And he says like, oh, "That's the one thing I didn't." plan for he was too much of a dipshit to pull it off <laughs> <laughs> but it uh it ends with like um boy it ends with Raylan driving ava to prison when he gets like uh rammed from behind by a fucking pickup which is driven by boone mm-hmm. who has um who was out with loretta uh to like try and fucking recover the money when like the police turned up and like uh, when Raylan turned up at like fucking the the barn where uh, where Markham was, and like they have a fucking they have like one final fucking quick draw showdown on the highway. What's really nice about it is they play the in the run up to this before the end of the episode they play the you'll never leave Harlan alive, yeah, which is the best yeah. way to set up that he might just be about to die, uh, if I've ever seen, and in a kind of in a way he does. But yeah, like um, they have the quick draw. They both fucking they shoot each other. But because Boone is like a fucking hipster prick and goes for the <laughs> headshot every time, he hits Raylan in the hat and just like fucking like grazes his skull rather than kill him. Yeah, whereas Raylan always goes set a mask because that's what they teach yeah. at Glinko. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, so then uh, like fucking um, like Raylan survives, but Ava flees in his car. And the hat's dead. And the hat's dead, yeah. Which is is pretty good as a way of like like putting a quota on it and visually showing that the old Raylan is dead and a new one is is, is taking his place. It's a really yeah. good with the proper love I mean, touch. You, you could argue you could argue that wearing the hat saved his life as well because like fucking like it's a tall hat, yeah. Yeah, Boone's an idiot and like aimed for the fucking like the middle hat the rather hat, than yeah. yeah the middle of the hat rather than his head, but um. Yeah, and then there's a there's a time skip to five years later, and he's he's in Miami. Um, Winona uh, is like he's he's in Miami with his daughter, and Winona turns up, and Winona is um, dating the the kid from Iron Eagle. If anyone else mm-hmm. remembers the eighties, eighties eighties. Raylan's there with yes. his wife and his wife's boyfriend. Yeah, I remember the eighties very clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But he's being a good dad as well. Yeah. He's like, you know, he's he's chill. He's not like his mm-hmm. father was. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really lovely. And he's wearing Boone's hat is another nice touch. Tried it on and it fit. Yeah. And then except, he, um... except except he's not wearing it during the scene with his uh his daughter. He puts it on after. Like yeah. showing that he's able to take the hat off now and not be that guy. 
is so nice. It's really yeah. well written. And he gets um he gets a tip of like the possibility of Ava's whereabouts, tracks her down to California. Um and like it turns out she's had Boyd's son and so he's not gonna turn her in. Um but as one last favour to her, he goes to visit Boyd in prison um with a fake ID and tells him that Ava died while using a stolen identity and they've only just found out. Uh just and... so that Boyd Boyd will never again try to like find her. And also, whilst he turns up in prison, Boyd is doing his born again thing again. You know? Yeah, yeah, possibly for real this time. Well, I mean, it was it was possibly for real the first time, but what can you do? Like, he's gonna play out the same. Like, it's Boyd is the perfect antithesis in this way, which is that Boyd will always play out the same patterns. Raylan's actually escaped Harlan. Yeah, you know, and so they have they have a they have a bit of banter. He explains what what like you know what's happened to Ava, and um. And then Boyd asks him why, he, like, why he came to the prison, why he didn't just phone him. Yeah, if you'll if you'll allow me a moment of it's like something. Oh, what is it a, a moment of sentimentality? Yeah. And uh, and like Raylan says, it's because we dug coal together. Uh, well, Boyd says it's because yeah. we dug coal together, and then Raylan just says that's right. And it's like that what that connection is so fundamental to the the whole, you know, duality of these two characters that. Even even in the final the final scene of the series, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Like, um... it's it's genuinely good. Like, it's it, I think this is probably the the most unanimous Praxis cast endorsement I think we've ever had. Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Season six is great. Glad you. Well... <laughs> <laughs> you listener should go and watch it and make your own opinion. You should. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Oh, yeah. Spoiler just don't alert, add us about it. For the last <laughs> two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, yeah. you know what? Don't at don't at Rob about it, but you can at me about Justified. I, I'll talk about this shit all day long. Yeah, even though even though we've like spoiled the shit out of it, like you should still watch it because it's it, just genuinely, fucking there, incredible. There are so many like snappy one liners that are genuinely very very good that like yeah. we could yeah. spend probably another hour just going over all the all of our favorite lines, favorite all the, all specific the cool yeah. favorite Tim scenes. Says. Yeah, all the cool yeah. things Tim says. <laughs> all the all the all the shit we have just talked about, we've covered maybe ten yeah, percent of like those, the full yeah. depth of just so many strokes. fucking incredible characters that we just haven't even fucking brought up because there's just not enough time. Um, yeah, it's just, and yeah, also it's a really good. There's not enough time, so show. shall we? Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, can, can I can I end on a note of sincerity? Dare I do that? No. I will uh, allow you a moment of sentiment. I, I will only allow you levity. <laughs> okay. Only, only because also... we cast pod together. Okay. Because we cast pod <laughs> together, just want to say, episode 200, pretty wild, was not expecting this. Uh, I, I'm glad we're still doing it. It's been great. And, you know, I, I'm glad that, you know, we get to do this each week. As much of a pain as it can be sometimes, you know, oh, we yeah, cast okay. pod together. It's good. Yeah. It's been, it's been a real adventure. That's right. Yeah, it's it's. I never fucking thought we'd get to one hundred, let alone two hundred, yeah. when we start yeah. this dumb shit. But you know, I don't know. Seems to work. And unfortunately, it will continue. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the podcasting will continue fun. until the UK improves, which is a long <laughs> way. <right? laughs> March into the grave. Yeah. Fucking yeah, hell. but watch Justified. What, yeah, do watch yeah. Justified. If you've seen it already, go see it again. I'll probably end up yeah. fucking watching this again pretty soon. Yeah. Um, there's so much just... there's so much incredibly good shit we didn't even fucking touch on. Like I, yeah. I yeah. only just only just thought like I'm not gonna I'm not, I'm genuinely not gonna spoil this for people, but the fucking ice pick guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, oh, yes, oh. yes. <laughs> fucking... <laughs> I, oh. I, I think I've watched it about six times in total, all the way through, and it just I notice something every time I rewatch. Is it's really, really good. Um, yeah, and it's just entertaining. Like it is not, it's not it's all really heavy. Was... fun. Like yeah, I think I was on, time. I was on my third, third rewatch before. I, like I noticed the bit where fucking um, I noticed Raylan's reaction to like Art outing himself as a hypocrite. Yes, at the end of season five. Mm-hmm. Um, which is just it, it's incredibly, it's an incredibly subtle like blink and you miss it fucking like performance from from Oliphant like, but yeah. Yeah, just go and watch it. Yeah. The fuck are you still listening to us for? 
Yeah, well, now that, now that <laughs> this is done, um, this opens up the way for Jamie to go and play Disco Elysium and for the rest of the podcast to watch and then do a cultural committee on Andor because those are things that were promised if I finished yeah. watching Justified and I am now cashing my fucking checks. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I will so. say in favour of, of Andor, uh, much as I loathe all space operatic things, which are bad and stupid, uh, Andor is good. And I did, did the, thing, the, the amount of pain I go through every time I have to say this is really quite genuine. <laughs> So All right, David, that's, that's David, your homework for the next big cultural committee is go watch fucking Andor and go play Disco Elysium so that we can all talk about it. Okay, David, yeah. David, I will absolutely do Andor, 100%, you've got me, but at some point we need to get you a Dark Souls. At some point we do need to do that, yeah. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Tears of the Kingdom comes out in a couple of days and I will be gone for a while. So <laughs> on that note, goodbye listeners. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye. And thanks for sticking Bye-bye. around for two hundred stupid we doing episodes. Plugs? Oh, fuck them. Nah, justified. Just... <laughs> justified. Yeah, watch Justified. Disregard yeah. just, 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 just our bullshit. Watch Justified. Bye. But still give Bye. us money. Bye. Bye. Bye.